people that seem to be working everybody did i hit record right okay it's being recorded very good all right that's great um all right so i want to welcome everyone today um for our very first northeast summit on uh climate adaptation for library facilities thank you all for being here we have a really good response this morning um so by attending today, what we're hoping is that you're going to come away with some very practical and concrete steps to improve and increase the resiliency of your library buildings to help mitigate future climate hazards. Now, I want to say that in the beginning, I believe it was Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and the Rhode Island State Libraries, they had begun meeting virtually um, this past year because they wanted to discuss and share all the damage that they were having from the heavy rain and the flooding that was um, really hit their states hard during the past year or so. And in their discussions, they figured that, that if they were having all of this damage due to flash flooding, that maybe some of the lower Northeast states like New York and New Jersey uh, might also be experiencing the same devastation. And so they graciously invited us to join their meetings, which is where the idea for holding this, uh, you know, a full Northeast summit um, that focused specifically on library facilities began. You know, we've talked a lot about probably in your states individually or maybe in different conferences, you've talked a lot about climate change, climate adaptation, sort of in general, uh, but really the concern that we wanted uh, and the focus on this um, summit was to be on how to prepare your library facilities for what's coming, for what's coming down uh, the pike and what's really, but honestly, what's here already. So I just wanted to go through a little bit to let you know what each state in the Northeast has really suffered the number of disasters uh, over the past few years. Uh, in 1920 to 1922, over half of Maine's counties were experiencing drought conditions and increasing fire danger throughout the entire state. There were severe storm and flooding damage in several counties in 2022. And in September of 2023, hurricane Lee's heavy winds, high seas, and rain spanned several hundreds of miles along the Maine coastline. In Massachusetts, Boston, and other regions across the state are experiencing extreme flooding as the storms intensify and climate uh, and climate with intensify with climate change. Their coastal regions are battling erosion, rising sea levels, and warming water temperatures. And while this past season has experienced heavy, heavy rain, they had widespread and severe drought the previous year. The weather extremes have affected agricultural and fishing industries and have disproportionately harmed low-income communities and communities of color. In July of 2023, Vermont experienced the worst flooding the state had seen since Tropical Storm Irene in 2011, receiving nine inches of rain in just 48 hours. Among other catastrophes, one of the rivers in the state capital jumped over 14 feet in the span of uh, just 20 hours. Homes and businesses were heavily damaged and some have still not recovered. 20 libraries had damage to buildings or equipment with one sustaining over a million dollars worth of damage. Farms were also hard hit and a widespread, widespread frost event uh, in May caused significant production loss. Connecticut saw severe rainfall in the first half of July, causing flooding that impacted 27 Connecticut farms, washing out more than 1,500 acres of land and causing nearly $21 million of agricultural damage. This past September marked the wettest month in New York City in the past 154 years, with a total monthly rainfall of 14 inches. Brooklyn and Queens were hit the hardest, but many spots in the Bronx, spots in the Bronx also had extreme flooding. The rain knocked out subways and rail service in parts of the area, and there were water rescues from cars and from 
uh, basement apartments. And at JFK, rainfall topped eight inches. New York libraries in particular felt the effects of superstorms over the past dozen years. And the New York State Library, through the State Aid for Library Construction Program, has been able to provide funding to assist them in rebuilding. New Hampshire, issued more flash flood warnings in July than it has for the uh, other entire year on record, any other year on record, with numerous roads being closed. And in 2020 and 2022, Rhode Island experienced periods of drought conditions. In the summer of 2023, a tornado swept through three towns, and overall the state has experienced more frequent flooding events in recent years. And in New Jersey, there were three major disaster declarations in July and another one in September due to severe flooding from the remnants of Hurricane Ida. On September 29th, a state emergency had been declared in all 21 counties in New Jersey because of severe storms creating hazardous conditions such as heavy rain and flash flooding. Unless you think this is all about flooding, last year, New Jersey had 775 wildfires as well. So climate change is predicted to bring more and severe frequent storms and increase the number of heat waves for at least the next 30 years. And that's even if we do everything right to try to turn the situation around. And library facilities for the future will need to adapt in the face of these predictions. And we hope that this summit will begin to help you do just that. So our agenda for the day, and. Yes, so there's our agenda for the day. We're gonna start out with our keynote, Rebecca, um, at 9.40. At uh, 9.45, Rebecca is gonna moderate a panel discussion with two uh, library directors who are gonna tell us about their experiences and um, what kind of damage their building sustained and how they wanna get about mitigating it. At 11.30, Sarah's gonna be joining Matthew Bullerman for, uh, to talk about the sustainable library certification program. And then we're gonna end the day with some resources that we put together for you and next steps and plans that we have to continue for another conference. So with that, I would like to start out with our first program, Climate Adaptations for Libraries. And I wanna introduce you to our fabulous speaker. Uh, we are pleased to, to um, partner with the co-founder of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, Rebecca Smith Aldrich, and also Matthew Bullerman, who's gonna be speaking later to produce this event. Rebecca is the executive director of the Mid-Hudson Library System, a cooperative of 66 public libraries in the Hudson Valley of New York. She is a leadership in energy and environmental design accredited professional, that's a lead accredited professional, a certified sustainable building advisor. She's the author of three books. You can see them there available from ALA and they are on the topics of libraries and climate change. And she has received awards from Library Journal, the New York Library Association and the International Federation of Library Associations. Rebecca, Matthew and other volunteer members of the advisory board of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative have created an internationally recognized program emphasizing climate action in three areas, mitigation, adaptation, and justice that is designed to help libraries live their values out loud while serving as a catalyst for social cohesion and civic participation. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So happy to have you. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you to the state libraries who banded together to talk about this topic and reach out to the Sustainable Libraries Initiative for um, partnership on the event. We're really excited to be here and share some of the thinking that we've been developing over the past eight years, thanks to a really robust uh, community of practice through the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. You're going to hear about some of the libraries in our program today, as well as a, a body of knowledge has just been uh, becoming more and more evident as we think about climate change. It's 
impact on our libraries and our community. So uh, what we're going to do today, though, is uh, really focus on the lens uh, of the facilities. That was the request from the State Library cohort that is producing this event here today. So I saw already questions coming in about education for the community and, and all sorts of things that we can be doing on the topic of climate action. And trust me, we could be here for days talking about climate action. But today we're going to narrow in and talk about facilities as it applies to community uh, adaptation for libraries and the role we play through those facilities. So um, just to do doom and gloom here at the beginning, I feel like Michelle already did that part for us this morning, but I'd like to just uh, double down on it and how severe this is because one of the issues I see in the library profession is there's no shortage of ideas of what to do around climate action, but there seems to be a lack of urgency and focus. And that's what we've been working on at the Sustainable Libraries Initiative to try to get people focused on the things that will have the biggest impact on their communities and their libraries long term in the face of what we're seeing with climate change. Now, it's no surprise to any of you that climate change has been setting record after record when it comes to severe weather, droughts, heat waves, all sorts of not fun things that are really direly affecting our communities. And you're right that the pace has picked up. Since the 1980s, we've seen a 78% increase in natural disasters and the billion dollar natural disasters that always get the really big headlines, many of which Michelle referred to here already this morning. In the 1980s, you would see about $1 billion disaster every, I think it's 78 days. Now it's every 18 days. So as we think about the frequency that is picking up the pace, it's being fueled by climate change. The idea that, you know, it might not ever happen here is becoming less and less likely. Many of you on this call have already experienced the, the massive impact of climate change. I saw the executive director from the Montpelier Library is here. and They sustained over a million dollars in damage because of the flooding earlier this year. And so climate scientists have been trying to wake us up for a very long time. And year after year, starting in 2020, they started getting very serious noting that we are going to look back on 2023 as the good old days when it comes to the weather patterns that we're experiencing. So the reality of confronting what we're seeing already, which is feeling overwhelming and dire and, and very worrisome to the people that we serve, we have to face the reality that it's going to get worse. And that's a tough thing for me to say here because I always try to live in hope, but we do have to understand that we have been behind on climate mitigation work for far too long, which has mean we are now uh, working on both mitigation and adaptation at the same time. So we're gonna be defining those terms for you, making sure you've got the vocabulary to do work in this area, as well as talking about specific adaptation strategies to help you with this work, particularly focused on facilities here today. So as many of you know, the American Library Association adopted sustainability as a core value in 2019, which is very exciting for those of us that have been really pushing for this over the past few years. And last year, they issued this call to action to the library profession, echoing the calls to action that we were seeing in the medical community. You may have missed it in the headlines of 2020, but uh, in 2021, every single professional medical journal, including The Lancet, produced the same essay and a, a call to action for the medical community, noting that in the midst of the pandemic, that still wasn't the greatest threat to global health. It's climate change. We've got the UN Secretary General screaming at the top of the lungs, code red for humanity. And so now the library profession is speaking with one voice on this topic and demonstrating a need to focus on this in many areas of our strategic thinking, including our facility plans. It's been dubbed now the grandest challenge of our generation. And it really does touch on almost every aspect of the work we do in libraries. So the challenge here with climate action is, uh, it makes me think of this quote, and many of you know this is my favorite quote um, from John Muir, often called the, the father of the conservation movement here in the United States, the father of the national parks movement. Um, but the idea here that when you start to try to dissect and understand and decode what's going on here, you realize it's connected to so many other things. We're not just talking about an environmental crisis, it's tied to the societal ch challenges that we are also confronting through the work we do in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it's all also greatly tied to our economic models and our economic thinking throughout society, which is a very unpopular thing to talk about in many circles. So today we have to really start to think about how all these ecosystems are intertwined with one another and how as we pull on one thread, it's going to be tied to some other things that are tied to either our building or society at large, which makes this obviously a very complex problem. 
So let's start breaking it down and at least get some common vocabulary. So we're all talking about the same thing here this morning. Climate action is a phrase that gets used a lot and different people mean different things by it. So the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, we use this, what we call formula, to break it down to the component parts because there are distinct areas of work. So mitigation is a word that you may or may not be familiar with, but it is the traditional climate action of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing the reliance on fossil fuels to heat our buildings and cool our buildings, as well as to get things transported and people transported around the globe. So as we think about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, this is very traditional and it's something that a lot of you are already thinking about. Maybe you have solar panels on the roof, you're switching to renewable energy. That's the type of thing we're talking about with mitigation. Also the transition to electric vehicles is a major component of the national strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But adaptation specifically is talking about preparing and adjusting in the face of the impacts of climate change. So it's the recognition that climate change is already here. It's already having devastating effects in many parts of our country. And we now have to adjust in the face of that because it is a reality for the future. So these two actions have to happen simultaneously in our planning. Uh, but all of that work needs to be done with an eye towards justice. And justice is obviously a very complicated issue in the United States. But to simplify it uh, for today's purposes, I'm just going to put it in this phrase, that we need to increase people's respect, understanding, and empathy for one another as we make new policy decisions to deal with climate mitigation and adaptation. It does not affect everyone equally. And systemic inequalities in our communities, in our country, are being exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. So that has to be acknowledged both as we seek solutions to the topics that we're going to talk here today, but also about access to the solutions that we're going to talk about here today, which again speaks to the strength of libraries being at the center of this idea of sustainability and climate action in our communities. So again, today we're going to focus down on adaptation. I know I've said that several times because in my world, I'm used to talking about all of it at once, but today we're focusing in here on adaptation. So I want to start out here with data, and I, these are two resources now that is collecting data and translating it for you in your location. And I want to acknowledge this early on today, because although we're grouped together geographically as the Northeast, we still have a lot of geographic let's say, variability amongst us here in the Northeast. We've got people that live near the coast. We have folks that are inland. We have folks in the mountains. We have folks that are dealing with uh, urban areas that are uh, not doesn't have very much green space. So the effects of climate change can look different, even here in the Northeast, from area to area, state to state, region to region. So making sure you understand your particular place and what the predicted impacts are, as well as what the retrospective impact has been, you can get very quick access to data through the National Risk Index and the Climate Explorer database. Both of those can give you census tract level or county based level data about your location, which can help you understand what are the primary climate hazards for your place in this world. How do you plan towards those? Not just a generic adapt adaptation strategy, but one specific to your geography. So Matt's going to be posting those links um, in the chat if uh, my email went through to him on time. But you'll also get a copy of these slides and be able to click right on the slide and go to these two resources and check them out. They're really cool. Um, before I move on here, I just want to say the National Risk Index, uh, it also lets you know things not just about what your highest level of vulnerability is for a climate hazard, it also talks about social vulnerability and your community's ability to withstand what is predicted to be happening from climate change in your region. So it speaks to both the environmental and the human aspects of climate change in your community. <clears throat> But I did your homework for you. I uh, looked up and cross-referenced several different databases, and I identified what we've got here as the top five climate hazards in the Northeast, just to kind of uh, help us give context to our discussion here this morning. So things that are not surprising to anyone on this call, the top hazards are more extreme weather, and that has a, a just a variety of ways it can present itself, from severe thunderstorms and crazy blizzards and uh, really high winds. We've all experienced, uh, I know I have, tornado warnings in areas that I've never seen before in my library system. We're going to see more intense and extreme heat waves, which is actually the most deadly aspect and outcome of climate change for the Northeast and really the whole world when you take a, a big look at it. 
uh, lower air quality and lower water quality overall, which is the systemic effect of a lot of the other things that happened, right? We experienced, uh, many of us here in the Northeast experienced exposure to the Canadian wildfire smoke as it moved south from Canada and air quality issues became a major hazard for many of our, our folks that we serve. Changing precipitation patterns certainly tied to extreme weather, but we're also seeing all types of flooding being affected on all types of waterways, whether it be from the coast or inland waterways, as well as uh, I think we see the runoffs in the mountains, areas that, you know, Hurricane Irene woke so many of us up to what flooding can look like in the mountains because of this extreme weather we're experiencing. So flooding patterns are changing. So if you were on a thousand year flood plain or even a hundred year flood plain, those numbers are not holding, right? We saw a thousand year flood in an area in the Hudson Valley that was never predicted to have that happen here. We saw uh, in Vermont two 100 year floods in one year. So these numbers are a bit meaningless in some areas of our country at this point. So rising sea levels, obviously the traditional kind of look of climate change and climate change propaganda of how we respond in these moments, which is part of the reason a lot of the country was slow to wake up to the need to deal with climate change, because many folks felt, well, I'm not near the coast, glaciers melting and rising seawater, this isn't really going to impact me, but it does. It's going to impact us in several different ways, both from people on the coasts being impacted by it, as we saw in Superstorm Sandy, and we continue to see in the aftermath of 2012 and the, the storm, subsequent storms that have resulted in beach erosion. But the rising sea levels, the warming sea levels are having systemic effects across the country, uh, impacting weather patterns, acid, acidifying our oceans, which is uh, compromising food sources and uh, oxygen absorption into the largest body of water on the planet, all sorts of really complicated things that do have an impact nationwide, including here in the Northeast. So uh, compounding all of these issues is the fact that in the Northeast, we have the oldest infrastructure uh, in the country. So as we think about the development of infrastructure in the United States across the history of our country, we know we got an early start here in the Northeast and we're showing our age. And so as we think about the vulnerabilities of our communities, it's not just our infrastructure as libraries, it's the infrastructure we are tied to when it comes to water access, uh, sewage management, stormwater management, how people get to us on the roads and bridges uh, that help to transport people around. And as you start to understand the weight of the age of this infrastructure and how vulnerable it is to extreme weathers and more flooding coming our way, you recognize some of us are in very precarious areas. Now, there's certainly libraries, and I know there's at least one on this call today, that are in historic buildings that actually have many features that exemplify what is actually ideal today. So some of our older building stock actually is very resilient and will hold up for the next 100 years. But other of us find ourselves in buildings that were built during uh, times with perhaps less attention to detail and uh, less of an eye towards longevity. So you can see uh, you've got a variety of experiences going on with the people who are on the call here today, but it's good to acknowledge it's not just your building you have to take into consideration, it's also the infrastructure surrounding your building and serving your community. Now, very briefly, I wanted to mention the fact that uh, while many of you might be thinking to yourself, 2070, I don't have to worry about that. But we do have to consider the fact that a lot of the impacts of climate change are forcing migration patterns throughout the country. And interestingly enough, the Northeast will be an area that many people choose to migrate to in the coming decades. There's actually a billion people who will be moving to different places to set up house just in the next 25 years. So imagine what it's going to look like 50 years from now. And so understanding that our communities here in the Northeast are going to become very desirable to folks that are currently living on the coasts and in the South, as well as the Southwest, is something to consider as we think about economic development, the future services we're providing, the types of buildings we're going to need in the future, uh, thinking that populations will perhaps go back up in the Northeast compared to some of the declining numbers we've seen in the preceding decades. So a little, little something there to put uh, in the back of your mind, but certainly not something to put into your, your facility plans for tomorrow. 
But let's get back to the, the issue at hand here and really talk about the nitty gritty reality of what we are facing. Michelle mentioned the uh, uh, flooding uh, in Vermont. And certainly when we got together to plan this workshop, I think it was literally a week after the first uh, flooding event in Vermont this year, which was really devastating and very scary. I know as a system director myself who has had uh, times uh, perhaps in Hurricane Irene where I couldn't get in touch with some of my libraries after a severe weather event, it's scary, it's disruptive, it's it's uh, threatening to people and it really threatens our facilities, something that we have a high degree of responsibility to be good stewards of. Now, could libraries in Vermont have seen this coming at that scale? Maybe not. So as we start to think about what should we be thinking about today to be as prepared as we can in the face of something called disruption, which by its very nature is unpredictable, what we're going to do is, is think like reasonable people, learn from others who have been through similar circumstances and do the best we can with the resources we have at hand. And I really wanna commend the state libraries on the call today because what they are trying to do with this event is to help you see how to leverage the money that is identified and earmarked in every single state for library construction and capital improvements to your community's advantage with an eye towards climate adaptation. So you're gonna see resources presented at the end of this event here today that help you connect with state funded programs that can help you find dollar resources to do some of the work you might recognize now needs to get done in your library building because of what your climate hazard priorities are. So something that's universal, regardless of where you are in the Northeast or what kind of building you have, is really understanding this cycle of planning for your facilities. And this is a great resource from the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, another really strong federal resource available to us as we think about climate adaptation. And there's very clear steps here. A library of any size in any location can use these same steps to create your facility plan enhancement to focus on climate adaptation. And you see right there, understand your exposure? What are the top climate hazards threatening your building and your community? What are the assets that are most at risk, both in your building and your community? And then what are your options to protect against those hazards? What have other folks in areas of, of the world uh, done to prepare for this? Um, I actually study a lot of uh, the Amsterdam and Netherlands libraries to understand how they, they build in the face of being uh, below sea level in the era of climate change. You can learn a lot about their construction techniques, how they design their collection space, uh, stacks, all sorts of cool stuff. So then making sure you understand what to prioritize based on what would be the most protective thing to do for your building and how are you then going to plan for that and fund that at the end of the day. So this helps you, many of you here are administrators who are working with boards or municipalities that have to help them understand the need to prioritize work in this area as well. This is a data-driven approach that helps you uh, identify other uh, iterations or ideas that can help be applied to your situation. So it's not just your bright idea. Uh, it's based on data and experience of others who have been through similar things that you are trying to protect against in your community. So great resource from the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit right there. Now, Again, universally, no matter what the major risk is that you are facing, whether you're down on Long Island on the coast or you're up in the mountains in Vermont, um, there's basic things to be thinking about. One, you wanna reduce the library building's exposure to the identified climate hazards? How can you minimize your risk on the outset of, of whatever it might be that's going to come your way? So, you know, for example, can you, like in Amsterdam, uh, move the collection up one level? So on the stacks, there's nothing on the bottom shelf because if flooding is going to be frequent, we all know everything on the bottom shelf is definitely going to get hit. Uh, are we actually going to be reducing our sensitivity to these issues? So let's say we know it's coming, we know flooding is going to happen in our region. What are some of the things we can put in place that will help us recover from that um, with the understanding that it's probably not going to be a surprise, right? We can all at this point predict some of the things we're going to see in the coming decades. So why are we getting ready for that today? So lowering the degree to which a system is adversely affected is really talking about your continuity of operations plan. And Michelle at the New Jersey Library has produced many resources for you that I'm sure are going to be in the resource kits, if not already shared uh, in the chat here today, for how to do disaster preparedness planning and how to do continuity of operations planning and thinking through the logistics of operating your library when disruptive weather or flooding is going to happen in your community. 
And then number three, increasing adaptive capacity. It could be a facility issue, but is more likely a human issue. The training of the folks that help in your buildings, your library workers, your library boards, the other support personnel that help make your building safe and welcoming to the community. How adaptive are they in the face of disruption? Are we doing training? Are we creating emergency kits? Are we doing the things that are, are necessary to support the human infrastructure that make our facilities so uh, effective as public library building. So basic things for all of us to work into our thinking strategically moving forward. So acknowledgement, we live in an ecosystem, right? We had the John Muir quote before, everything's tied together. So pulling on that one string is probably going to focus on something else. So at the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, as well as the American Library Association, we are focused on the triple bottom line of sustainability. It's not just about the environmental changes that need to happen. We need to understand those changes impact on humans as well as ec the economy. So in all of the strategies I present here for you today, I just want you to keep that in mind. There's no one perfect solution uh, for the challenges that you are presented with. Uh, you may have a very complicated building. You may be next to a wetland. You may may have a municipality that doesn't believe climate change is real. You may have all sorts of challenges we're not going to have time to address here today, but this is a common framework through which to make better decisions tomorrow than you may have made yesterday. So if you're a member of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, you know there's tons of training on this. The Sustainable Library Certification Program we're going to talk about later helps you practice this thinking throughout all areas of facility management uh, and planning for the future. So buildings are a system, and this is a really key learning. Uh, Michelle mentioned that I'm a lead AP. I'm also a certified sustainable building advisor, uh, which you probably don't really care about. Uh, but one of the most important things I learned in my training is how a building actually works. And what does it mean if you want a highly efficient building and you want a really tight building envelope so you keep all of your heat or your air conditioned air in there? What does that mean for ventilation and actually fresh air? How do you balance those two competing interests sometimes? So understanding that your building is made up of, of interconnected components that work together to produce that building is really important. When you find a solution for one problem, sometimes it can cause a problem in another area. So we really do need to be educating ourselves and working with professionals that can help advise us on the, these fronts. And I'm going to point out a couple of those intersections as we go along here today. So there are certainly guidance systems out there for you. There's holistic facility rating systems that are built around climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation strategies. And some of the stronger programs here, like uh, the Well Program Lead and the Living Building Challenge, also address very well social equity issues and the, the choices that we're making about our facilities. A very strong programs there that you could use to structure your thinking, particularly if you've got a major renovation or construction project on the horizon. The Sustainable Library Certification Program, which you'll hear more about later this morning, is holistic both for your facility and your institution as a library. So it helps you think about the culture and uh, organizational culture of your library policies, as well as decisions about your facility when it comes to operations, landscaping, materials management, all sorts of good stuff. And Matt's going to explain more about that later this morning. So First, I'm giving you homework right away. Don't you love me this morning? Um, but I really do believe that more libraries need to start integrating climate adaptation and mitigation strategies right into their board approved facility plans. Um, so we certainly have a facility plans that address accessibility issues, capacity issues, things that we wish were new and shiny, but we've got to start getting serious about putting pen to paper on climate change strategies in our facility plans. And so you might be kind of having a big question mark, like, well, what would that look like? Well, let's start looking at some of the early adopters of of this thinking. We've got the Concord Library in Massachusetts, who's also a member of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, and they've written really one of the first sustainability plans for a public library in the United States. It's right on their website. You can totally crib from it. They've done some great thinking for themselves and also looking to align themselves with municipal priorities, which I'm sure I, I wouldn't bet money on it, but I bet it draws more money to their efforts for being aligned with municipal priorities. So if you're looking for examples of what could that look like in a facility plan, this is an awesome example for you. But again, first, you've got to educate yourself as to your major climate hazards, what your building is capable of and where its vulnerabilities are, and then start cherry picking the different approaches from other libraries doing this thinking that could really help accelerate the work for your library. 
So let's get to really, really practical stuff. This is what the, the State Library folks were really looking for today. So I took my uh, uh, privilege here to set the stage a little bit and give you some key things to think about in case uh, we have situations for uh, libraries on the call today where some of these strategies don't really apply, which could potentially happen. So flood protection, we saw extreme weather and flooding. It was in the top five things that are going to be impacting the Northeast in the next several decades. So most of us have to think about flooding one way or another, um, whether we're on the coast or we're impacted by stormwater management systems that get overwhelmed in urban areas, all of these things are possible. And so we have to assess how vulnerable our particular infrastructure is to flooding. Where might that flooding come from is one question, but what are you gonna do about it is your responsibility, right? And so there's very, uh, simple and straightforward techniques for helping to flood proof facilities. Uh, so I just categorized a couple of them here for you. So if you're thinking of building a new library, maybe don't do it in an identified floodplain. Uh, maybe you're already in an identified floodplain and that's just the way it is. We've got to find those adaptation strategies to help you manage the realities of that situation. So taking a look at the, the basement floor, what's sitting on that floor? Can you raise it up? A lot of us have our HVAC equipment right in the basement. Um, so can we jack it up? Can we get it on blocks? Even lifting it a few inches off the ground can make all the difference in a minor flooding event. Of course, major flooding events, uh, all bets are off and how severe they can be so it's hard to predict. But the smaller events, which are going to be more frequent, even a few inches off the ground can make a very big difference. So thinking about what floors of your library are most vulnerable uh, to flooding is something to consider. And also if you're connected to a municipal sewer system, making sure you've got a check valve installed so that you don't have sewage backup coming in when the stormwater management system gets overwhelmed, which is happening more and more frequently, right? We just saw flooding in September in New York City where that was a major problem. Um, so for anyone who is a, a fan of the John Green show on uh, HBO, he talks about this a lot. Uh, so constructing barriers outdoors, we're going to talk a little bit about permanent barriers, but also knowing what would your options be if you had to suddenly get sandbags or build temporary barriers? Where would those materials come from? Where would be the strategic places to build those temporary barriers? Where's the water most likely to come from? These are all things to know about your property and your building. And then if your library has a basement, sealing the walls with waterproofing compounds is probably a pretty good idea. Uh, if you've seen any water in the basement at all, that's a good sign that it could get a lot worse with a heavy rainfall or an intense rainfall like we've been seeing here in the Northeast over the past few years. So part of permanent flood mitigation is green infrastructure. Green infrastructure can uh, be a phrase used for a variety of things, uh, but in particular, it talks about how we use plantings and landscaping to manage water on the sites that we are also responsible for. So you might be familiar with rain gardens, with bioswales. You're going to hear a speaker, both of our speakers actually on the panel are going to talk about how they've used those to good advantage on their property. Uh, you also need to think about where does water go after it falls on the site of your library. Uh, when you think about heavy rains coming down, where does the water go? Are you going into a municipal stormwater system? Do you have a catchment system? Is it just kind of sitting there? <laughs> um, so making sure you're working with engineers that help you understand where the water goes, how to manage it, how to angle it away from your building, but not damaging maybe neighboring properties would be one of those intersections that has to be considered in this ecosystem that we live in. So permeable pavement, if you're not familiar with that, that's pavement that looks like regular asphalt, but allows water to drain back into the water table. Uh, we have one of the first major applications of that here in the Mid-Hudson Library System, believe it or not, thanks to New York City. Uh, part of my region is covered by the New York City watershed up in Greene County and Ulster County, and they help to fund a demonstration project at the Mountaintop Library in Greene County. There's a very cool video on YouTube you can see of a dump truck dumping a dump truck's worth of water onto that library's parking lot and all of it just getting absorbed into the water table without overwhelming the stormwater system and, and pushing debris into the watershed. So again, the sensitive nature of what's around you. Are you near a watershed area? Do you have a wetlands that bu buffers on your property? One of our uh, panelists is gonna speak about that as well. Uh, and protecting those wetlands, those are actually flood barriers and people don't realize that. They actually think it increases the likelihood that you will flood if you're near a wetland, but more often it's the opposite if it's been well-maintained. It's actually helping to contain water so it doesn't bleed into other areas. And that's certainly taken into consideration in zoning and building codes in municipalities. So hopefully that was the case when your library was built, but sometimes it's not. So getting an expert opinion on that would be very, very helpful. 
Now, trees do a lot of good things for us. They give us clean air. They give us more stable soil so it won't wash away when we have a lot of uh, rainfall on our property. Um, but it also creates that uh, source for more water to be absorbed back into nature. So thinking about how trees play a part in your, your landscaping, if you have the opportunity to use that, this is where I go crazy because I'm thinking about the urban libraries that are on the call right now who are like, yeah, trees. Yeah, right, Rebecca. Uh, but for those of you that can utilize trees for both shade and water absorption, they're a huge friend uh, to our property and nature to make sure we're managing a, a host of issues that are going to be exacerbated by climate change. We mentioned your building envelope before. If you're not familiar with that phrase, I wanted to take pity on you. We're talking about the structure around you, the roof, the walls, the windows, the doors, the basement, and the foundation. That's your building envelope. And all the places those components are purchased from or connect with one another are points of vulnerability in your building. That can be both for the purposes of energy conservation, for uh, keeping floodwaters out, uh, for keeping the building cool. All of these component parts have a variety of options when you're replacing them or renovating them to make better decisions related to energy conservation and flood protection. So I'd like you to educate yourself about that. You can get to know the Energy Star program. You can learn more about this through what's called the Passive House Institute, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. But I just want to make sure I defined that phrase before I just kept spitting it out to you here this morning. Now, Passive House is a construction approach. And so those of you that are facing big construction projects in the future, particularly new construction, I encourage you here in the Northeast, this is a very good solution for many new builds. In our system, we have the very first public library building to be certified by the public, the Passive House Institute. And this is a super smart way to construct buildings in the future because it doesn't rely on mechanics to deal with ventilation, uh, HVAC, and some other issues that, that crop up in our buildings. It uses passive technology, so thicker walls, more efficient windows, lighting schemes that are really designed to interplay with your mechanical HVAC system. So if you visit the Phoenicia Library in the Catskills, it's a lovely library. Um, it's uh, really, really popular in their town. They just won their vote yesterday, so yay Phoenicia and Pine Hill. Um, but they also really thought about how to keep their operating costs down. So as we start to think about the economic component, both of the impact of climate change and how we got here is certainly driven by uh, economics. But a very key thing to explain to board members uh, when you are municipal municipal leaders, when you're seeking out some of these strategies for your particular situation, is to understand that some of these smart decisions that you make can actually lower your operating costs. So this is a library that really had an eye towards energy conservation and the use of fossil fuels. They use this technique to build this new library. They have almost double the square footage, but their uh, heating and cooling bills are less than half than they were in the former building. So you can do the math on that, what the efficiencies were, but an excellent return on investment for thinking uh, through the lens of climate change and how to build better buildings in the face of rising heating costs, the need for more conservation techniques. Uh, when we come to energy and how we're using it, as well as respecting the need for humans to actually have fresh air, uh, to breathe and be healthy. Uh, this library has what you would uh, be surprised to see, a rather small mechanical HVAC system in the, in the attic, and it has a really cool button on it. It's called the party button. So when the occupancy of the building gets to a certain level, they hit the party button and it ups the uh, exchange of fresh air in the building. Um, so it's recognizing the fact that you can have a tighter building that's better insulated, but you still have to get fresh air into it for the humans that need to occupy that building. So next up for those of you in more urban areas with less green space around you, your buildings are particularly uh, being superheated by climate change. And as we see the predictions of more and extended heat waves, um, Michelle speaks very well on the topic of uh, this being actually the most dangerous outcome of climate change. We get very caught up in the big headlines about uh, flooding and what could happen in our area if it hasn't already happened. But the kind of everyday challenge of climate change will manifest in extended and more severe heat waves. So in areas where uh, your library may be where there's not too much green space, not too many trees helping us out with shade, and cooling down the ground, or you've got a lot of pavement around your libraries, your buildings could be anywhere between two and seven degrees hotter um, than other libraries that are in areas that have more green space. So designing buildings that are cooler, um, whether it be with cool roofs, uh, using reflective paint to reflect sunlight radiation away from your building, and right-sizing mechanical
mechanical systems to keep those buildings cool. Um, that's going to be a higher level concern for those of you in more urban areas, more paved over areas, shall we say. So keeping buildings cool, uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. And it's really going to depend on your building type, um, the era your building was built. These are some common features of keeping your buildings cool, making sure you actually have uh, operable windows for airflow, particularly if we're going to have more extended power outages. We need to be able to open those windows and get fresh air into our buildings, making sure we're getting, uh, I'll use a word here that will make uh, someone on this call laugh, uh, more better fenestration, right? Windows, fenestration in our buildings, uh, getting that UV blocking glass. It's again, not going to allow more heat gain into our buildings, but to protect our buildings and reflect sunlight away. So we don't keep getting hotter and hotter during those heat waves. It's hard to avoid, but all these little things put together can cool down your buildings. Uh, building in shade, whether it be from landscaping and trees or creating overhangs over windows or porches that cool down the fronts of our buildings. These are uh, perhaps things to integrate into new builds or to retain if you're ever renovating an older building. And looking at the materials being used for newer construction or retaining them in older construction, it's best if we can use uh, high thermal mass building materials like stone and brick and concrete, but those also have entanglements when we start talking about new construction and where those materials are going to come from. So on the right, you see a picture of the Morton Memorial Library and Community House in Rhinecliff, which of those of you who have taken Amtrak uh, down the city, you passed through Rhinecliff. Um, but their building, which was built in 1908, has almost all of these features. So as we start to think about historic buildings and the old adage that the greenest building is one that already exists, making sure we understand how our older buildings work and why some of these features are so valuable and learning from the older buildings stock in our communities can help us make better decisions with new builds we might be responsible for. So again, trying to address the spectrum of experiences that I know folks on this call have, just because it's an older building doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of the attributes we need to keep it cool. Often they're even smarter buildings than those built in the last few decades because they didn't have mechanical air conditioning. Um, so they were already built with the idea of airflow being necessary to keep the building and its occupants cool. Now, we get a lot of questions about light-colored roofs, uh, cool roofs, and paint that reflects solar uh, radiation, and that can depend on where you are. So it's not a given. You'll see NYSERDA here in New York, our Energy and Research Development Authority. Sometimes they have money for this, and sometimes they don't, because the thinking keeps changing, because I think it's very specific to your location and the amount of green space around you of how much you need that. Because in the Northeast, we also have to consider the darker roof draws the sunlight and the radiation to us during the winter time time to heat our buildings up so we don't have to pay so much to keep them warm in the winter. So there's that balance. There's that triple bottom line coming into play again. So understanding how nature works, so helpful. <laughs> So as we think about eco-literacy for our communities, we also have to educate ourselves as folks that are stewards of the built environment in our libraries. So a good thing to understand of where to plant those trees to actually provide the shade that you might need in addition to the water retention assets they can bring to your property is pretty important. Now, I want to shift a little bit of our talking here in the, the second part of the adaptation strategy uh, part of the talk here. And this is a document or I'm sorry, graphic you may have seen before, especially if you're in New Jersey, because I know Michelle's presented it several times. This is FEMA's disaster recovery framework. And so going back, a lot of things I just talked about are the everyday considerations, right, that the everyday climate change impact of rising heat the heat index going up, uh, severe heat waves being something we're going to contend with on a pretty regular basis. But there are those extreme events that happen, the flooding that we talked about before, the blizzards that happen, extended power outages due to trees being down after a high wind event. We have to start modifying our buildings in order to provide services in the aftermath of those events. We keep saying libraries are essential. We got to have a library in our community. We need to be part of these conversations for both uh, prevention and prevention preparedness work in the face of what's coming with climate change, but also thinking about the role of our libraries in building community resilience in the aftermath of some of these disastrous events that are unlike, unfortunately going to befall uh, those of us here in the Northeast. So thinking through, what is my building capable of in the aftermath of 
the most likely climate hazards for my region? What are some key features to be building into our buildings to be what people need in that moment? And so many of us have learned such hard lessons um, from the, the rains in Vermont this year, from Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Irene, and other more isolated events. We've gotten a crash course, unfortunately, in some of this thinking. So let's learn from some of those people, right? We know that libraries are being seen as places of refuge in the face of the impacts of climate change in three primary areas, technically four, which I'll explain in just a minute. But we know we're going to be considered cooling centers moving forward. In New York, we've got a movement to get every single public library listed on the State Department of Health's list of cooling centers that are listed by county. The state doesn't even care if you have air conditioning, that you could have a fan, you can be a cooling center. And it's because some people are really desperate in these extended heat waves. 20 to 30% of folks in the Northeast do not have air conditioning. And as we look at states like Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, where air conditioning has not been a priority in the past, it's going to become a priority in the future. Warming is another big thing that we are thinking about in the Northeast. We're certainly seeing it in the Midwest libraries. We're seeing a huge movement on this topic in the UK libraries, which is very interesting. But thinking about the economics of heating oil and being able to pay that bill as the heating oil costs fluctuate. And as we watch the conflicts in the Middle East and the, the challenges of diplomacy from our country to other countries that help supply oil to our country, we can see it's a very volatile market for the future. So we're gonna have more people that are struggling to pay those heating bill costs. The library becomes that cost saving place to come and spend the day and warm up and not have to rely on that cost at home as much. Uh, we had reports even this winter of more people coming to the library for long periods of time to warm up and not have to rely on the heating oil at home, which really is speaking to just the basics of human existence there with the cooling and warming centers uh, of libraries. Now, the other unfortunate thing that we got a crash course in this year is air quality. And being an air quality refuge is another role that libraries are emerging uh, as playing. We're seeing it out on, in Washington State. Matthew and I uh, were talking to a colleague out there who's designing a library, and their goal is to be an air quality refuge for the wildfire smoke that's been just lingering in their town. When we saw the wildfire smoke from Canada come down, I recognized that here in my own building, all the work we did to upgrade our filtration systems because of COVID were serving us well in that moment as well. But it does mean if we're going to see that more frequently, we're probably going to have to change those air filters more frequently. We may need portable air purifiers in those moments, which is new equipment that needs to live someplace and needs spaces in our building. So a whole new thing to think about. Now, one of the most popular things to talk about when it comes to adaptation strategy is solar and storage, getting off the grid. So for example, we hear all these stories that still are so stuck in my chest when I think about this. Uh, in Superstorm Sandy, both on Long Island, particularly in Queens and Brooklyn, these low-lying areas that were so devastated by Superstorm Sandy, um, recognizing that libraries in that moment, many of them felt very unprepared. Um, they recognized that the power went down and they couldn't open uh, because they didn't have electricity themselves to start helping to serve uh, the patrons and the members of the community to connect with FEMA resources or to be a collection point for food and clothing. It really hindered our ability to be available in those moments. So you'll see in Brooklyn, they prioritized getting a couple of the library's most vulnerable areas, the lower lying areas along the coast. They can be off the grid in those moments now because they have both solar and battery storage for their solar systems, right? It can't just be solar because once the grid goes down, you're also down, but you got to have the storage for your own system on site so you can keep running off that battery storage and keep going until the utility company can get you up and running. Uh, and pro tip that I know Michelle talks about all the time in her talks is making sure libraries have talked to the utility company and make sure you're on at least tier two, a priority for uh, getting you back up on uh, power when it goes down in an extended situation. They need to understand how critical library infrastructure is in the aftermath of these events. We are warming stations, we are connectivity stations, we are gathering places for the community. And the quicker they get us up, the more respite folks in our community can have until their homes are brought back up. Now, whole building generators, I think, and here in New York, that was one of the more recent changes to commissioner regulations that was made for the state aid for library construction program. We are now allowed to spend that money on whole building generators. And this is another way to get up and running quicker, right? Solar isn't feasible on all buildings. This is another potential solution in that direction of getting up and running as fast as possible in the aftermath of events. The um, installation picture that you're seeing here is from the South Huntington Public Library. Janet Shear is the director there. She's on the 
board of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. And she tells this story about how uh, she was the, I think the assistant director during Superstorm Sandy and how it broke her heart. They couldn't open the library when people almost needed them most in the aftermath of that storm to help them find balance and restoration and connect with FEMA resources at a faster pace. So it was one of the first things she did when she became the director of the library was got a whole building generator. So they're ready because they see it's very likely another storm at that level of intensity could happen in their region. Now, outdoor spaces, we learned in COVID how important outdoor spaces are. You've got a picture here from the Harbor Fields Library, the library most recently certified under the Sustainable Library Certification Program. They have solar charging stations that folks can use to charge their phones. So even if the grid goes down, even if the library can't open, folks can come over to the library and charge their phone. Outdoor spaces are so critical for uh, issues like the pandemic, but also in those moments where maybe you can't open the building. But just a reminder, libraries are not buildings. Libraries are institutions. You can take your services outdoors. We learned that during COVID. So watching the Kingston Library here in my system develop their outdoor spaces for people to gather, to have programs, to be able to deploy other services in those moments needed to be a priority in their space because they aren't able perhaps in this moment to have off the grid power or to have the whole building generator on the footprint of that particular library space. So outdoor space leverage that to your advantage, if you're lucky enough to have it, can help with issues uh, related to power outages, gathering, as well as food security, which you're going to hear about in our panel uh, when Margaret Woodruff speaks. Solar EV charging, we're not seeing a lot of that here in the Northeast. We're certainly seeing a growth in electric vehicle charging infrastructure at libraries. And I have a little secret goal that I wanna make sure every library in my system has electric vehicle charging, because I think it's the smartest spot in the community to have it, because then your door count goes up, because people gotta come in while they're waiting for their door to, to their car to charge. But thinking about where does the power come from, to charge that electric vehicle, right? It's a systemic issue of where did the power come from? So I'm really curious to see, will solar car charging really take off here in the Northeast? Because that would be the most resilient thing to be offering because it doesn't matter what the electrical grid looks like in that moment. We can still charge the cars that everyone is pushing us to purchase to get off of fossil fuels. And I'm I'm here for the debate about electric vehicles. I know someone's like, you know, frothing at the mouth to tell me that's not the best thing for the environment. You're not wrong, but we're not wrong either that it's going to help mitigate climate change. So again, got to find the balance in these conversations. So last point I want to make, and this was thanks to a great conversation with our, our two panelists we're going to speak with next, is thinking about the interior design of our buildings. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a single library in my system that says they've got enough storage uh, or that their space is flexible enough to their, uh, their liking. But those are two major things to think about here in the future as we consider the role that we will play as climate change changes the nature of how communities interact with us and each other. Um, thinking about how to be able to reconfigure spaces easily for different purposes is going to be pretty critical, which was already pretty critical to pull off the programs that we already know we want to do on an everyday basis. Um, but thinking about lighting, do you have daylight coming in in case the power is out or you can only uh, have a generator for a portion of your building? And the need for outlets. Uh, we saw this in uh, Hurricane Irene, one of my libraries down in Putnam County, the Mayapak Library. They had an unbelievable line out the door of people that just needed to charge their phone. We had someone who needed to charge their wheelchair and keep their oxygen tanks going. We had folks that had to dry their hair because they still had to go down to the city to go to work. Um, so more outlets than you think you need is what you need in the future in our libraries. And then storage might uh, be a little different in the future as we start to think about the diversity of things we may need in these moments to provide services like during COVID, uh, like in the aftermath of a hurricane or a major weather event, we need to have some flexibility, of course, for our space. We are going to need different equipment and supplies to meet the needs of our communities in those moments. So I just pulled together a quick little idea of a supply list of things we may be needing or things we might want to be able to lend out to our communities in these moments, thinking about how to expand our thinking around the library of things, the library of things in our libraries takes up a big footprint. So storage for those things has to be considered in new ways when we design new spaces and we rethink our collections. It's not just traditional stack space, not even traditional storage space that we may need to display these items and have ready access to them in the moments where it will matter most. 
So I want to close here with a, a list that has served me well for the past decade. This is the Resilient Design Principles from the Resilient Design Institute, which is based in Vermont, which makes me so happy we're working with all the state libraries here uh, in the Northeast today. But this is a list, again, that I think it is universal. It can help you with your thinking, regardless of the situations that you are being confronted with by climate change in your particular community with your particular building. These are just guiding thoughts to keep in mind as you make decisions. And I highlighted a few of, of the 10 here for your consideration, which has come up already here this morning. Um, so as we think about adaptation, what we're trying to do is to increase resilience of our community, as well as the resilience of our library, of course. But libraries don't exist except to serve our communities. So as we think about the adaptation strategies, we've just done like a fire hose uh, exposure to here today. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is help make sure basic human needs are being met through our facilities. We're making sure that we've got redundancy in our system. So if one thing fails, it doesn't mean the library building has to close. We're taking a look at different opportunities to simplify things. Can we make more simple or passive design choices that aren't overly complicated? So if a, a piece in the machine breaks down, everything shuts down in our buildings. And really investing in durable goods, durable materials, paying for things that actually will last a long time because libraries are gonna last a long time. We have to be around uh, to serve our community. And that means we need to invest in materials, building materials, mechanicals that are gonna stand the test of time and make the best possible use of community uh, tax dollars. And number seven, I, I like a lot, anticipating interruptions and a dynamic future. It's kind of a shiny way of talking about disruption uh, of our society in both climate change angles, political angles, whatever you wanna use, but understand understanding that adaptation of our facilities is going to require library administrators and boards to have a mindset of continuous improvement and iteration. Uh, as we start to understand the effects of climate change better, uh, Michelle uh, shared with me earlier this year a really scary statistic, which is that even if we did everything we were supposed to to turn climate change around, we really got our act together when it came to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we did it tomorrow, we would still have at least 30 more years of increasingly severe weather to contend with. So that means for most of us on this call, for the life of our professional uh, career, we will be contending with this issue. And so acknowledging that, building it into our plans, training our staff and boards to think about this stuff now is really important. So here in New York, we just released the new edition of our trustee handbook for New York State trustees. And we wove in thinking about sustainability throughout almost every single chapter of that sucker, because we want everyone thinking about this. It's everyone's job, whether you're a trustee, a library director, a library staff person, a library friends group member, to think about the impact of climate change on our communities and translate what we know we have leverage on in our libraries to help our communities be more resilient. And some of the choices you make about your facilities will be the most important important things you do. But at the end of the day, it's going to be that justice angle, the respect and empathy and understanding we have for one another and our ability to come together and solve problems. That's truly going to be the key to our adaptation strategies. So that's where I decided to leave you uh, during my keynote talk here this morning. Michelle's going to help us moderate any questions that have come in here. And then we're going to have the opportunity to hear from two practitioners while, and, and hear their stories of how they've been adapting their thinking for their facilities and services moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. That was really awesome. And you really crammed a lot into that one hour, I want to tell you. Um, yeah, somebody said, whew, awesome. So we do have uh, one question and sort of a part B in the chat. And I want to, um, <clears throat> all right, and I want to just reiterate, there's some questions or um, really great comments like in the chat. Um, but let me get to the Q&A first, because that one came in in the very beginning. Um, and it's from Gail. And Gail says, as we look at capital renovations, what our adaptation library should be considering today? On a different note, for sustainability and environmental education, what are some public education opportunities that libraries have incorporated, for example, with their solar arrays, geothermal, et cetera? But then Gail has a clarification there I want to read out. Um, my education question is around facilities uh, changes we make at the library, geothermal and solar, and ways we might educate the public to increase the impact of the changes we make, awesome. where they see the effects, for example, and looking for creative ideas. 
Cool. Great question, Gail, because I think you're doing two things. You're making the administrative decisions of how to guide your renovation project. And so again, there's programs out there like LEAD and Living Building Challenge and the WELL program that can help you think through the choices you're about to make in that renovation project and do so with an eye towards sustainability and adaptation. So there's existing programs out there, whether you go with a building professional that has experience with those or that's not the world you live in and you got to have a DIY approach, you can educate yourself on some of those choices. Choices, but I encourage you to work with design professionals and engineers that really value sustainability and climate adaptation in your project. And if you don't, to make sure that you've prioritized it in your building program uh, that your architect is held to as you make those decisions. You could also learn about a lot through the Sustainable Library Certification Program. It's kind of that DIY approach we've created for more small uh, libraries throughout the country. Um, so you can get a lot of guidance uh, in that area through a kind of checklist methodology that walks you through building envelope, landscaping, water management, energy management, and really thinking through all those systems and making better choices. But the second part of your question is, is one of my favorite things to talk about, which is the idea of the library building as a living laboratory, where you make all these great choices, but no one knows after the press release that announces that you made those choices. So having signage in your building that points out a lot of the smart decisions you made and why you made them, doing programming around those features of your building that help to continue to point out what a good job you did with that building and to educate people how that might translate to decisions they make in their own homes or what it looks like community-wide to make decisions like that, the library as catalyst for inspiration through programming, uh, as well as education through the library as living laboratory, I think is a really smart thing to be prioritizing. Because as we think about our collections, and what does it mean when we talk about collections anymore these days? Um, you know, the library of things has really busted open people's thinking, but why can't the building be part of the library of things? That's a thing. We can teach people through that building. So Gail, I think you're on the right path with those questions. And I don't think you probably needed me to answer those at all, but thank you for asking it so we could surface it for others. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. I think there was a comment kind of related to that from Michaela, who said our library educates the public through passive sustainability signage tours policies, using our building and practices as learning opportunities. And also the uh, Sustainable Libraries Initiative certification process is rigorous and super helpful. We're doing it and we recommend it. So there you go. There's a plug for your upcoming talk with Matthew coming up. Um, well, hey, Michelle, before you go on, I just want to give a shout out to Michaela, whose comment you just read. We just had her help us with a um, free webinar we did for Web Junction, talking about really groundbreaking work her and her director, Lisa Oldham, have done to build a new building that is the first to use the design for freedom uh, path to make sure none of the building, well, a subset of the materials used for that building were certified not to have been on the supply chain or been impacted by forced or slave labor. So talking about the triple bottom line and social equity and decisions that we make. Like, true adaptation requires us to put humans at the center of those decisions. And the New Canaan Library is a top-notch example of that. Great. Um, there were a couple other comments in the chat. Uh, I don't see any extra, uh, any other questions right now in Q&A, but you still have time to put them in there, everyone. But um, someone asked, does porous asphalt have a specific name? So if anyone knows, do you know that, Rebecca, or... There's certainly different brand names of it, but I think if you said porous pavement to any professional, they know exactly what you're talking about. They can advise you on what choices are solid. There's, I, mean, I shouldn't have said solid, right? There's a little pun for me. Um, when you're thinking about the products, there's a lot of experimental products out there. One of our libraries ended up with an experimental lime uh, composite that did not last very long. So when snow plows went over it, it became a hot mess. Um, so making sure that you're getting something that's been proven and applied in other situations. I don't know that libraries really need to be the test bed for that stuff moving forward anymore. There's a lot of good opportunities. There's two applica major application categories. One is an application that looks like traditional asphalt. You can't tell by looking at it that it's porous pavement. And then there's also um, blocks that can be inserted almost as the buffers between landscaped areas and paved areas. That's also referred to as porous pavement. And it helps with drainage in that situation as well in, in a smaller square footage uh, um, footprint. I mean, that that is so important because, you know, when I look at all the flooding in the Northeast, uh, I look at what's happened in New Jersey. I live in Pennsylvania and we had some also some massive flooding uh, a few months ago that uh, caused several deaths. It was just, you know, flash flooding. It was really, um, really, really horrible. 
But you know, the thing is, and then what's happened in New York? I mean, there's no, literally no place for the water to go. This is why all of this is so important. Um, there's just no place for it to go. The runoff, the, the storm drains and all those systems were simply not meant to take on the kind of water that's being dumped in any of our states at this point. So anything that we could do to incorporate, you know, some sort of a, a better drainage system or a better runoff system is super, super um, important, I think. Um, there were a couple other comments that I noticed. I just want to shout out uh, from the chats. Um, Sandra Kronz from New Jersey noted that a sustainability plan is part of their library strategic plan, which is, of course, you know, a great idea, you know, um, so highly recommend that and congrats to um, Sanders Library for doing that. Um, also, there was a good suggestion in chat. You mentioned uh, uh, some ideas about extreme heat. You may have said this already, but I just want to note it again. Solar canopies that could pop up. I think you, there were some pictures I saw. It might have been in one of your uh, previous presentations, Rebecca, about the Boston Public Library. Mm -hmm. They would have up these like, sort of these pop up shade tents, you know, whenever they needed to. It's kind of like the stuff you bring to the beach, right? Remember when your kids were little and you probably wanted to protect them from everything. So um, I thought that was a good suggestion. And okay. before we move on, I'm just going to look down the bottom. It says we could use a session or three on financing green initiatives because much of the upfront costs are prohibitive. Yeah. And, you know, a, a couple of uh, quick tips for you on that front. Those of you that are already members of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, you don't have to be a member. You can just pop onto the Sustainable Libraries Initiative website. Check out our, our newsletter this month because we have three federal sources of money to underwrite a lot of the things we talked about here today. And nonprofits and government entities are now eligible for some of those incentives. So we've itemized those for you in the newsletter. So it's sustainablelibrariesinitiative.org. You can get to that information. But that's part of what's going to be in the resource kit that's introduced at the end of today is all the state libraries helping to identify in our states, where can you find sources of money for some of this work? So good question. And, and you know, again, kudos to the state libraries on the call today for getting ahead of this issue. So yeah, they want discussions on funding, design choices, and more. Um, and another plug, somebody said, I suggest everyone join the SLI. Um, it's extremely cost effective and helpful for all sorts of staff members and stakeholders, no matter where they are in their eco justice journey. And I think that's one of the things that I really love about your program, uh, Rebecca, is that a library of any size could do something. Mm -hmm. All right. It doesn't, I mean, yes, if you have, if you have money, that's great. You could do anything. You could do all of this. But I think the important thing is for smaller libraries, mid-sized libraries to realize that some of this stuff either doesn't cost money or costs very, very little. So um, it is a scalable program. Um, and it's something that I think that um, libraries, um, all libraries of any size, any size should um, be able to, uh, to do. So uh, I see that uh, Kathy um, has raised her hand, but let me see. Um, would you, um, do you want to ask a question, Kathy? I'll I'll, I'll allow you to talk if that's okay. Is that okay? I've 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 unmuted you. So, let's see if I could do this right. I've asked you to unmute. Michelle, there's also another question in the uh, Q and A. Okay, uh, Michael, if you could get a chance, maybe unmute uh, Kathy Mulholland, and I'm going to take a look at the Q and A. Is that all right? I'll take a look. I'm, I'm working on it now. Um, okay, thank you. And from Caddy, another Q&A from Caddy Gregory. Any suggestions for how to incorporate basic human needs into the library's mission statement? Our statement includes education, recreation, community, but doesn't really extend to life or death. Libraries are one of the last true democratic institutions, and including language that covers emergency survival would be great. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Kathy had her hand raised by accident. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah. So Kathy's question is a great one. And I, I wish we could see Matt Ballerman right now because I know he's got the answer to this one too. Uh, many years ago, we did this um, board retreat for a library um, 
down in Suffolk County. And this was one of the things we were working on is how to have a mission statement that really reflected uh, the commitment to sustainability. And I, I still fall back on Simon Sinek's start with why, right? When you think about the language that we use in our mission statements, how much of it is about either how we do what we do or what we do, instead of talking about why we do what we do. And so getting to the heart of why libraries do what they do, I know you could, you know, we can argue about, is it a mission statement? Is it a vision statement? But get it in one of them. Come on. Like, we've got to really educate people as to why we exist, why we were here. And you'll hear, I guarantee Matt will probably say it later in the morning about the purpose of libraries and what we're really here to do. Um, so I think, Caddy, you're thinking along the same lines we are on how to be, better tell the story of who we are and why we do what we do to connect with more people um, in the new era of climate impact and how to be a good partner in those moments sometimes means we have to talk about ourselves in some different ways. It's not even always doing different things. It might just be framing how we talk about what we already are and what we already do in different ways for new people to connect with us and see us as a community asset. Yeah, that, that's a great answer, Rebecca. And, you know, I think you and I have talked just a little bit about this, about, you know, we're always thinking about uh, programs that we want to do uh, going forward. And I know we need to, we're over and we need to get into the next part of the program. But, you know, after a disaster, when everyone comes to your library, probably about the first thing that they're going to want is health information, too. So um, there, there is a role for librarians to play in the health of the community, helping with the health of the community after a disaster. And so I think that's something we can explore going forward. And finally, I'm very interested in reaching trustees more effectively. How do you convey the need for focus and urgency to trustees? who don't see any such need. And I just bet you can apply this to every single state. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, part of the approach we took in, in my own system and, and thanks to the partnership with the State Library with the Trustee Handbook and a program we have called the Trustee Handbook Book Club, um, which you're all welcome to check out if you want, it's online. Um, you know, helping trustees understand their role as stewards. They're called trustees because they've been entrusted with public dollars, with a public institution to make good choices for the future of that community. And so to take that idea and pull the thread all the way through it, how could they not be taking into consideration the major climate hazards that are facing the community you are charged to serve? So you, framing it in the, the, using that word stewardship, I found very effective with trustees because they mean well, they're doing their best, they're volunteers. They're not always well-versed in all of the myriad of intersections of what's going on in the world and how it impacts library planning or our facilities. So trustee education is something that we highly prize. Uh, here in New York, we were able to pass a piece of legislation that now mandates uh, trustee education, which has had you know a mixed reaction amongst the trustee community. But you know, last week I was at the New York Library Association conference and every single day of that conference, I talked to at least one director who came up to me and told me their board is doing a better job because we now talk about capacity. We now talk about stewardship. We now actually talk about climate change, but not always using that phraseology. Sometimes we're talking about cost effectiveness of libraries moving forward, and that requires controlling operating costs, which is very well tied to renewable energy and getting off the grid and not relying on unstable markets for heating and cooling our buildings. So pick your, your pleasure of how you talk about it, but understand your audience. What motivates them? What drives them? They want to do a good job for their neighbors. They want to be seen as using tax dollars wisely. So couch messaging using that framework. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. I want to be able to move on to the next uh, panel dis discussion that you're going to moderate, and I will let you introduce uh, our directors. But this goes back to my point that I want to share again, is that this whole thing is scalable. And so libraries of all size, please take note, you can do something. And I think, Rebecca, you're going to be pointing that out. Um, and so I'll just turn that next section over to you again and hopefully bring on Rachel and, and Margaret. 
Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, what a good segue to this section, because I've actually, uh, I'll just reveal this now, known Margaret Woodruff for several years now. I uh, at, met at the Vermont Library Association when I was uh, lucky enough to be invited to speak there. And Margaret's a, a big advocate for small and rural libraries and really has kept us honest in the development of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative to always take into consideration the realities of small and rural libraries. So to have her here on this panel is really exciting. But I want to invite Rachel and Margaret to have their cameras on. Go ahead and unmute yourselves while I introduce you. Uh, the plan here for the panel is I'm going to introduce Rachel and, and Margaret. They're going to give you a little background of why they're here today to talk to you. I have some questions for them, and then you're going to be invited to ask some questions of them. Um, they're really looking forward to your questions, by the way, I'm sure. So let's get started by meeting Rachel. Rachel is the director of the Norwell Public Library in Massachusetts, and she became the library director fairly recently, but has been involved in the library since 2017, which I believe was only about two months before they started a new a massive building project. Uh, so she got a crash course in a building project and learning that community and being a big part of shaping the future of that community. And she's here to tell us a, a little story about that new building and some of the choices that they made and what it looked like when a really severe weather event hit their community and what the library was able to do because of really smart choices they made during the design and, and construction phase of their facility and grounds. And Margaret Woodruff is the director of the Charlotte Public Library. And I want credit, Margaret, for I hope pronouncing your library's name properly for probably the first time in my life. Um, but Margaret, I have to say, is, is one of my favorite people. She's also a member of the advisory board for the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. So I count her as a friend as well as a colleague. But uh, Margaret had the opportunity to really shape the future of her library and her community through a very big building project that she's going to tell you a little bit about. Um, but also, you'll see a lot of decisions that Margaret made are uh, and her board board and, and her team there have made are related to broad community issues, not just some of the adaptation issues that are traditional thinking about buildings, but also getting into the area of food security, which is a major issue we didn't really get a chance to talk about today. So I'm glad Margaret and Rachel are here to expand on some of the important topics we brought up in the first segment of today's event. So Margaret and Rachel, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yeah, we're having us. <laughs> So I'd like to give you each a chance just to tell your own story in your own words before we hop into questions. Um, so Rachel, I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting on that. Yeah, of course. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be joining you all today. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, I am the director of the Norwell Public Library here in Norwell, Massachusetts, uh, where we serve a population of 11,350 people. And in June of 2021, we opened the doors to our brand new library building, thanks to a grant from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, um, Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program. Um, and, you know, just to provide a little background about the new library, um, the library went from 8,500 square feet in the old facility to 22,300 square feet in our new building. Uh, we were awarded LEED Silver Certification by the U.S. Green Building Council. And for those who don't know, um, LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental uh, Design. Um, the new building possesses a high-efficiency all-electric HVAC system. We have electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, we have a stormwater management system that includes bioretention swales in our parking lot, as well as a courtyard rain garden, which helps you know minimize any natural disturbance, um, especially since the library is surrounded by wetlands. Um, all of our exterior light features in the parking lot and courtyard um, control illumination and are rated to minimize light pollution. And um, the building also has a partial building generator that powers the left wing of the library, which includes our meeting room, cafe, our public restrooms, and our lobby. Um, we were extremely grateful for the inclusion of the generator, um, especially in October 2021, when um, the town and most of Massachusetts South Shore was hit by um, a bomb cyclone, which in our case was a nor'easter that you know rapidly intensified and caused intense rain and heavy winds. Um, since Norwell is you know a heavily forested area, there was an extreme amount of tree damage and the town experienced a five-day power outage. Um, luckily, the library was not damaged in the storm and the library was able to mobilize 
and we were used as a warming and charging center during the aftermath of the storm. Uh, we were able to set up, you know, charging stations in the meeting room. We utilized our mobile hotspots to provide, you know, Wi-Fi for the community. Uh, our public restrooms were available for use. We had running water and heat. Um, we had tables set up for study, games, anything you could think of. And um, overall, we were able to be a valuable resource for the community during this emergency. Cool. Thank you, Rachel. Margaret, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. So. Um... As Rebecca mentioned, I'm the director of the Charlotte Library, which is spelled like Charlotte. Um, and it is a town of 3,800 people uh, south of Burlington on um, the shores of Lake Champlain in Vermont. Um, and we were fortunate enough to embark on an expansion and renovation project uh, in 2019 and 2020. Um, we were open for a week before we closed for COVID. So. That was um, an adventure in itself. But um, some of the amazing things that we were able to include, thanks to really heads up um, work on the part of the design build company that we worked with, was an all electric HVAC system. Um, so while we doubled the size of the library, our energy use was not doubled. So um, that was a uh, very attractive for those those folks in our town who are counting pennies, ours and theirs as well. Um, and the building envelope included upgrades to the existing windows in the older part of the library, as well as the installa installation of very efficient windows in the new part of the library. Um, and one of the most visible additions to our library was the installation of a rain garden where a driveway used to be. So that was to offset the impermeable surface that was added when we put on the extension to our building and also um, created a place to um, take up stormwater runoff from the roof uh, on a, of our building. And um, I am also one, and I'm very excited to report that uh, we had a vote last night in our town on whether or not we were going to put solar panels on the new town garage, and it passed. So we will now be a net zero building uh, going forward. So that is really exciting. Um, as you mentioned, Rebecca, one of the important things, and it, this particularly became you know, on everybody's mind during COVID was the ventilation. And we've had some good luck with uh, an air exchange and um, portable air purifiers uh, in our building as well. So it's sort of that balance between uh, energy efficiency and keeping everybody uh, safe and comfortable as well. Um, I think that's a good introduction. <laughs> Absolutely. So both of you described features that were really, you know, delib deliberately chosen during the design phase and you credited uh, other people with some of that work, but you also helped to influence that. But I, I want to kick off here to help a lot of folks that are online who are you know, maybe thinking in the future, they've got these types of pro opportunities coming up for renovation and construction. Um, how did you ensure those ideas got prioritized and actually implemented in your design projects? I'm, I'm curious, Rachel, because you were saying you were the assistant director at that time. You know, Were you able to influence the prioritization of some of those features? How did that work out for you? So um, luckily the, the library staff was heavily involved in the planning process. So we were lucky on that part to be able to um, share our ideas and wants. And um, I would say at the onset of the building project, our architect strongly pushed LEED Silver certification and um, the library's building committee fully endorsed this idea as well as town administration, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, those involved in the project, you know, really wanted this building to be a point of pride in the community and um, a leader in the town in regard to, you know, energy efficiency and sustainability, especially in being LEED certified. So many of the features that I described um, and that we had hoped to include, such as, you know, the EV charging stations, um, the, eight, the new HVAC system, the rain garden, um, all of those things, the partial building generator, they were, you know, able to make it to the final product thanks to, you know, support of our building committee and, and town leadership. So you had, you had agreed at the top what the priorities were and you kept that in mind the whole time. That's great. Exactly. 
Margaret, how about you? You had a, a lot of stakeholders involved in your project. How did you keep this stuff at the, the top of the list? Well, as I mentioned before, we had um, a really innovative design build company that we were working with, and they uh, brought in as part of the initial design all of the features. Uh, they wanted our library to be a sort of test case, a model for some of these uh, efficiencies that had just come on the line, so to speak, in a more uh, substantial way. The um, We also had a lot of help from our energy committee in our town. And if you have an energy committee in your town, I would recommend working with them because they can really help you highlight some of the um, possibilities that are available and help advocate for changes or inclusions that you might like to have in addition and um, expansion work that you're doing. Um, one of the uh, things that has been particularly important to, um, you mentioned this earlier, Rebecca, is working as a heating and cooling center. And Rachel, you talked about a very specific incident and we've been part of our emergency management team. So those folks have also been supportive of our efforts to be a more efficient and accessible space. And um, it occurred to me one thing that we had happen last winter is the daycare center across the street lost power and they were able to come over here and in a much smaller scale, but similar to you, Rachel, we had lunchtime and playtime and it worked out beautifully. And it was just such a great example of how you can make a space work uh, in a in an unexpected situation. So um, that was really great. And I think another thing that has been important um, thinking about uh, bringing people on to, to help you is getting that community support too. So the daycare center and other folks around town have been supportive and it was nice to have that be reinforced. Like there's a reason you did this. So um, that's been very gratifying. Cool. So it sounds like along the way, you, you both made some new friends in town, uh, <laughs> thanks to your project. Can you talk a bit about some of the partnerships that emerged thanks to your focus on climate adaptation? I'm sure. Um, in Norwell, uh, since we've opened the new building, we've definitely found that it's increased collaborative efforts among community groups and other town departments. Um, you know, for example, after the October 2021 storm, it, it definitely brought awareness to the library. Um, being a valuable, a valuable resource during these times of weather events. Um, and we've established a strong relationship with the town's um, com Community Emergency Response Team, or, or CERC for short. Um, Norwell CERC team is you know, comprised of FEMA trained citizen volunteers who help to assist first responders in case of a natural or man-made disaster. Um, and it also includes, you know, representatives from the fire department, uh, the Council on Aging, the police department, and of course the library. Um, and we found since the new facility opened, uh, we've been, you know, designated as a town warming and cooling center, um, along with the town senior center uh, in discussions with the CERT team. And um, we've made, we've had many occasions during both the, the winter and summer months where uh, we were called upon to, you know, serve um, that function for the community. Margaret, how about you? Um, yeah, I think uh, similarly, we've been part of our emergent, the town's emergency management plan um, and on that team. Uh, Fortunately, haven't had too much call to be other than the daycare event that I mentioned, um, but we have been open as a cooling center and a warming center for our town, and we're part of the uh, Vermont alert system, so a notice can go out in our town to let folks know that we're open, and we've, you know, had the flexibility to extend hours if needed um, to make it available to people, and um one thing I think it's it, it's come up a lot is having like chargers and things like that. We have um, some of the best Wi-Fi access in our town. So this is a go-to place if people uh, need to get to work or just let their families know they're okay after the blizzard or whatever. So we've had a lot of um, uh, good response to that as well. 
Well, Rachel, I want to go circle back to that phrase you used before the bomb cyclone, which is like a phrase a lot of us just learned possibly in the last year or two. But can you talk a bit about what you learned through that experience that might be helpful to others on the call today? Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, with with the timing of the storm and um, how quickly we found ourselves in a situation where we you know, needed to mobilize quickly for the community, uh, we definitely found there was, you know, room for improvement in regard to being prepared. And, um, but I would say, you know, at that time during the October 21 storm, um, staff, you know, we had just moved into this new facility. We were still learning and adjusting to the new building, working out the kinks, so to speak. And then suddenly uh, we found ourselves, you know, called upon to serve the community in a way we hadn't been able to before in our old facility. Um, but, you know, staff really rallied and, and came together and brainstormed what we could do for the town at this critical time uh, when almost everyone in town was without power. And we definitely learned how, how crucial it is to have flexible spaces uh, that can be adapted to various needs. Uh, you know, for example, we, we're easily able to, you know, reconfigure areas in the library powered by the partial generator, you know, such as furniture in our meeting room and lobby to, you know, best suit our ability to offer charging stations and Wi-Fi access. Um, and, you know, we also found this, this experience also led to uh, the developments of the library creating an emergency kit. And this idea came about through discussions with Norwell CERT team. Um, about the success of the library's efforts after the storm and what we could do to be ready should we ever, you know, experience a situation like this again. So uh, with input from SERP, um, we created a box of what we found to be essentials and what residents uh, showed the most need for while they were um, here at the library during the power outage. Uh, so that included um, power strips, extension cords, batteries, and uh, we now have a designated mobile hotspot that we keep in our staff workroom in case of internet outages. Um, so it, it was a whirlwind experience, but uh, we learned a lot about the library's ability to be resilient and how quickly we were able to adapt in situations like this, you know, thanks to our new facility. Cool. And thank you, Rachel, because I, I think your conversation sparked when we were planning for the panel. You know, Margaret started really kind of itemizing some of the things she's learned along the way of helping to support the community in these moments as well through the facility. So, Margaret, could you share some of those tips with the, the group here today to help them think about how the space got used in some unexpected ways? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, similar to Rachel, we uh, have an emergency kit and given uh, our sort of remote location. Um, some of the things that were recommended were also some personal care items that we have in our kit. So we have, you know, some diapers and some toothbrushes. Uh, should anybody need those if they're unable to get back to their homes? Um, and we've also um, designated an area if people need to bring their house pets with them. We don't have room for your cow or your horse, but you can bring your cat or your dog. Um, we have a designated space and there's, you know, an agreement that you have to sign that you'll look after your pet and um, manage any cleanup that needs to be done. But I think that was a big relief for people that might not want to have to leave, uh, you know, a loved one at home that can't get here on their own. Um, and uh, I think I mentioned this before, but we also have, thanks to a grant from the Department of Libraries, we have some portable air purifiers and those have, again, speaking to the flexibility that you can move them where they need to be. Uh, if you're gonna have a bunch of people that need to be in a particular part of the library, you're able to keep that place feeling a little safer for folks. And we have a, carbon dioxide monitor that actually enables us to see what those levels are when there are a lot of people in one one particular place. And again, circling back to our um, energy committee, they have helped us tweak the system here. So the air exchange. So we're um, seeking sort of maximum efficiency with maximum safety. And um, it's been really interesting to see that our, in fact, our uh, air quality has stayed the same, even though we've been able to uh, make some adjustments. 
And, and Margaret, you're really speaking to that topic that came up during the Q&A earlier about basic human needs, like clean air. And I know you also specialize in getting people access to clean and affordable food. Also thinking about the food security of your community um, through some of the choices you've made with your uh, property. Could you speak to that a bit? Sure. So um, with the uh, expansion project that we undertook, we installed the rain garden that I mentioned that um, offsets the storm water. And then we also have some food gardens. Uh, so this nice slide that Rebecca put together for us, uh, the big picture is uh, the food garden. Um, we're growing some garlic and squash and green beans, and those are available to folks who visit the library, but also go up to the food shelf um, for uh, for people to have access to if they need it. Um, the upper right hand corner is a picture of one of the rain barrels that we have that um, take up the water that comes off the roof, and then when they're filled, the uh, um, rest goes out into the swale of the rain garden, and it's. Last this past summer, it was amazing to watch that in action because those rain barrels were full and it it worked. It was very cool. And in the bottom uh, right hand, one of my favorite uh, parts of our new library is our Charlie cart, which is a portable kitchen. If you don't know about them, I can't recommend them enough. Uh, and we've used it to do a variety of things. We made some applesauce. This was a slide from a um, salsa program that we had using uh, local produce. And so folks could come together and taste some salsa and take some salsa ingredients home with them and um, you know learn how easy it is to make something like that um, with things that you just have around. Um, and then I just to put a little plug in um, for, um, a Charlie cart is quite a, a capital investment, and we were fortunate enough to get a grant from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, and um, they have been very generous. So I would encourage people to look for grant opportunities for things like that when they can. And Margaret, the Charlie cart has a pretty big footprint for a smaller library. Where do you store that? Um, right now, it is the new picture book display table in our children's area but it also it's great because then it's sort of a conversation point and people are like so what's this charlie card thing and you know why are all these drawers and and uh it's um so it kind of is advertising and utility at the same time uh, rachel i'm gonna throw you a curveball this isn't on our script but I made a note to myself when we were talking the other day, when you talked about the stormwater management system in your, your library, and you mentioned like the roof interplays with the courtyard and the wetlands. Can you speak a little bit about that? I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you about that earlier. Yeah, sure, of course. So um, the way that our roof is designed, um, uh, the water that the stormwater that comes down on the roof is funneled and it has creates um, a waterfall effect that goes into the courtyard. And um, the water from the um, from the stormwater it goes into the stormwater management system, and it is slowly, you know, released into the wetlands. Um, and it is it's a very cool feature that uh, our patrons love. <laughs> when you mentioned it, it reminded me of the. Oh, the Hendrick Hudson Free Library in Westchester County. They're our first library to be certified under the Sustainable Library Certification Program. And they also have a specific roof design that goes to like a, um, a rain garden and the bioswale. Like it's a whole system that's integrated between the building itself, the landscaping, um, and the just the basics of where water goes when it falls onto the property. It's really, really smart. Very well done. All right, I've got one last question uh, for Margaret before we go to your parting thoughts and best practices. But uh, Margaret, you are a really early adopter of the Sustainable Library Certification Program. You even inspired a cohort of Vermont libraries to, to join in on it. Can you talk to folks about what that program brought to your climate adaptation efforts? Sure. Um, I think, again, as a small library, it gave us a framework and uh, some sort of substance to work with. The the notion of sustainability is such a large one and can be very overwhelming. And I think having the uh, certification steps to follow uh, gives you, um, it can seem overwhelming at first, but I, it's rather the opposite once you kind of get dug in that you realize, oh, I do this, I'm gonna look at my sustainability policy and then that's gonna inform this. And then that helps us think about 
uh, this next step that we need to do. And and I feel like right now we're about halfway through and it's informing everything we do. It really helps us think about uh, every step we're taking and it, um, it, it really um, engages the staff and the board, I think, again, and I, I have to say that, you know, hats off to you all who put that together because it really makes it very accessible. So thank you so much for that. Um, and then I just want to say it also really helps to have this group of colleagues here in Vermont that we're working together and, you know, we have monthly meetings and someone will say, well, we just finished this part of it. And someone else will say, well, how did you do that? And so that that collegiality also really helps. And I think, again, having the framework that we're all working on together um, makes a big difference. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we've got a few more minutes left here for the panel before Q&A starts. So I wonder if you might want to share any parting thoughts or things you wanted to mention earlier that didn't get a chance to, to work in yet. Uh, I don't, Rachel, do you have anything you wanted to add? Um, sure. So, you know, going through the process of constructing um, a LEED certified building has been extremely educational. Um, it's definitely taught me ways in which libraries can, you know, take a leading role in their communities and, you know, leading by example, um, especially, you know, by educating our communities and what we've, you know, done at the library to achieve these goals. Um, you know, whether what we offer in our library, uh, you know, uh, a building fact sheet that exemplifies everything that was done during the construction, the features of the building. Um, uh, we offer, you know, programming on sustainability. Uh, and we also have, you know, um, a digital display in the library dedicated to green education and how the library achieved lead certification. Um, so we've just, you know, found there's many ways in which libraries can be, you know, an educational resource and um, be able to, you know, reach out to their communities on this topic. Um, one of the best things I've learned during this process, you know, if um, if your town has something similar to, you know, Norwell's CERT team, I, I would definitely recommend reaching out to them and finding ways in which, you know, the library can assist and, uh, and support the community during these, you know, extreme weather events. Um, I think what we've definitely taken away over the past few years is, you know, definitely look ahead and, you know, have a plan in place. And Rachel, I just want to commend you because I, I felt like the choices you've made with your building help position your library differently in the eyes of people in the community post construction and occupancy. Really, really a great model for what can be manifested by great choices with a facility. Well, Margaret, any part parting thoughts or best practices you want to emphasize? Um, well, I, I feel like I'm just repeating things people have already said, but I think partnerships are so critical. Um, in addition to working with folks here in town, we've been fortunate enough to work with, uh, we're a demonstration site for a local stormwater mitigation group. Um, so working with them has enabled us to be a, a place of education as well, as well as giving us the opportunity to learn a lot more. Um, we work with our, our local slow food a chapter here in Vermont and offer, um, we have a plant a seed program um, that makes uh, seeds available to folks in the community as well, if you wanna grow your own um, beans and whatnot. Um, and I think just looking for all those possibilities is really important because I think it can seem so overwhelming to try and try and take on any of this. And then, um, uh, just another plug for, for grants. We also got a grant from the New England Grassroots um, Education Fund, and uh, they have been a certainly on board with sustainable practices. So um, I think if people are looking for ways to get started, that's a great way to get started in a small way. Cool. Well, thank you both. I, I can see we've got some questions that have come in, but before I uh, jump on those, I, I really want to thank both of you for um, being willing to serve on the panel and share your thinking and really showing that even small decisions that are made on a renovation project or how you operate a facility can have a, a big impact on your community and the future resilience of your community. So thank you very much. 
So we've got a few minutes here for questions from the audience and just a reminder to folks to please use the Q&A feature of Zoom here in this platform so we can manage those and make sure you get your questions are seen. Um, so let's see, we've got a question here from Drew. Uh, asking about when your libraries are being used as these refuge centers, either cooling or heating centers during the emergency, do you remain open 24 hours? Are people sleeping in the library? How does that work? Um, I would say in our, our, um, in our case in Norwell, we uh, stuck to library business hours. Um, so we were not um, equipped to be open 24 hours a day, but um, we were able to open for our regular business hours. And that's the same for us. I think there's a whole bunch of different designations, Red Cross and FEMA and otherwise. And so we're designated as a center and that has sort of specific guidelines that we follow from um, the Vermont Department of Health has a very helpful worksheet if you ever need to look at what would make a cooling center or a warming center. So it's the same a, thing. Yeah. A good tip. I know here in New York, there's a very specific criteria for housing folks overnight. And most public libraries couldn't meet those criteria primarily because there's no showers in most libraries. So I would say it's probably state specific in terms of the rules around uh, allowing folks to sleep overnight. Um, so be cognizant of that. Uh, Marie's got a question here about, uh, I guess this one's for you, uh, Margaret. People are curious, what is a portable kitchen? They weren't familiar with the term, a Charlie cart. So our Charlie cart, it is uh, sort of portable in, in name only. It's not like you could just walk down the street with it, but it is, a, you know, it, it weighs, I don't know, 600 pounds or something. Um, but it is on wheels. We've wheeled it out to the parking lot. We had a canning demonstration during COVID and everybody sat in the parking lot and we learned how to make dilly beans. Um, it has a gray water sink. It has an oven. It has an induction cooktop. It has a blender and you plug it in and you can cook. It has a wonderful curriculum for teaching kids kitchen safety and fun nutrition. Um, I Yeah, I think they're wonderful. So that's what a portable kitchen is. We weren't able to fit in a real kitchen in our program room, but this ended up being actually a better alternative for, for us. And Margaret, was that paid for through a grant as well? Yeah, that was an NLM grant, yep. And remind folks what NLM is? Uh, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. And there's, I don't know, nine regions or something across the country. And, and each of them has um, a certain amount of funding made available. Um, we are in Region 7, New England, and I think New York. So, um, And they're all about public education, about wellness and health. So a good resource. Perfect. So we got a question here from Caitlin, which is a, in my mind, it's like a throwback question, but it's not really. Um, Caitlin's asking, uh, related to some requests they've received recently for a public phone. Do you folks uh, allow for public usage of the phone at the library? Or do you have a designated phone for folks to use? Um, kind of reminiscent of a, a pay phone model at the library? We just let people use the phone at the desk. It's not... Uh... Yeah, we, we don't have, I would say, um, a designated public phone, but, um, you know, in, in situation, in certain situations, emergencies, you know, we, of course, let our patrons use our, the staff phones. The pay phones are not making a company, it sounds like so far. <laughs> All right, folks, we've got time for our, probably one more question. If anyone had another question, you want to pop that into the Q&A box. Um, but let me see. I think we did pretty good on time, folks. We got. Uh, uh, got to our Q&As right on time. And I think we covered everything that the three of us thought would be important to talk about. So, uh, Michelle, I don't see other questions coming in. Let me know if I missed something. All right. Um, oh, I think there is one more. I, I want to add one more thing, though. Um, uh, I noticed during a lot of these heat emergencies down south over the summer that uh, a lot of the governors would call for all the resilience centers to open. And in some states, that meant the libraries too. So in some of those states, the libraries were officially designated by the governor as you know resilience hubs to be opened when they declared the um, when they declared a heat emergency. That is not the case in New Jersey, um, but I don't know if it is the case in any of your other libraries. Also, I want to throw uh, and there is another question here. I want to throw one more thing out. You know. Um, 
we talk a lot about like when libraries are hit after a disaster and you know we're available, we are considered an essential service uh, according to FEMA, and there is a, through the Stafford Act, there is funding available to get the libraries up and running again. That's how important um, you know the designation is for them. But there's also a thing that you could do to either further increase your capacity and your ability to serve the community, uh, but you have to do it ahead of time. Now you know we are not designated recovery centers. That's a FEMA. A, a designation and libraries, most of them, the majority of them do not have that official designation. However, there is something that you could do ahead of time and it's called like an electrical pigtail, I think it's called, that for less than $2,000, you can have an electrician put this on the side of your building, this pigtail. And that means you can let FEMA know that if you're in the middle of a disaster area where they need to come in, you're already, they can roll right in and plug right in and set up right alongside of your library mm. uh, to provide services. And so this is something you can think about going forward because it's relatively inexpensive to do. You could probably get somebody to pay for it for you, but that really is going to give you increased capacity. Should you be designate, you get that designated hit in your area FEMA is going to, that's what FEMA is looking for. They're looking for some place to go in, plug in and set up immediately. And that's one thing you could do to help out. And of course, you would need to check all that out with FEMA first. But um, I think that that's a really great recommendation. Um, Rebecca, I think you have one more. Uh, Jordana, I think I see something. Oh, maybe a couple more. Oh, no. She, um, yeah, do, she has another question in the chat if you want to take a look at that. Sure. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I got it now. Uh, let's see. Do you provide native plants in the seed program or an education on native plantings to reduce flooding? Are those program areas for either of you? Yes. Yep, we yep. have definitely had um, local um, nurseries um, come to the library to give discussions on, you know, drought resistant gardens, what people can do at home to, um, to, uh, to assist with, you know, uh, sustainability, um, and things like that. Yep. Fantastic. All right, Michelle, I yeah. think we've got all everything in the Q&A at this point. And, uh, you know, uh, somebody says my mind turns to unbenefited and unpaid staff uh, uh, acting as life-saving personnel. Too bad there isn't grant money for that. There is not. But later on down the line, we might do something on resilience hubs and how you can use spontaneous volunteers in the community to help with that. So with that, I think we have two minutes before the next program. So I'm gonna be turning that over to Deborah Dutcher um, from New Hampshire for the remainder of the program to set up Rebecca and Matthew. But why don't we take two minutes so everybody can stand up for a second? Cause I didn't, I always forget to like put a break in. So while you're setting up everyone else, take stand up and shake out if you want. And we'll start exactly at, in two minutes. Margaret and Rachel, everyone said in the chat, you're awesome. So thank you so much for joining us.
Okay, well, I have it is 1130. So in this next session, um, Rebecca will be joined by Matthew Boleman to talk about the National Sustainable Libraries Initiative. Matthew is the CEO of the Hopog Public Library in New York, and he's also the co-founder of Vice President of Sustainable Libraries Initiative. So um, take it away, Rebecca and Matthew. <laughs> Will do, Deborah. Hi. Thank you so much. Matt, welcome to the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning. Excellent job so far. This is great. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, happy to be. All right. So Matt and I had this crazy idea about 10 years ago, and now we're uh, neck deep in the Sustainable Libraries Initiative uh, with a bunch of our friends and colleagues who believed like we did that there was a need to think differently about libraries' uh, role in the face of climate change. And so that's uh, a very short story uh, that I just told that actually is a much longer, more interesting story, but we don't have time for that this morning. But we wanted to do a little introduction to the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. Uh, whether or not you're a member or not, you have access to a lot of resources through this program that can accelerate your work and thinking and connect you with a community of practice that can help really uh, focus your energy in ways that matter. Um, that's something that I like to do is to spend my time on stuff that matters and makes a difference. And so that's why I find like-minded people that like to do the same thing, like the crew that put this event together here today. But the Sustainable Libraries Initiative is a group of volunteers just like yourselves who got together and started to think about what does the library profession need in order to become a leader on the topic of sustainability. The context of climate change is, is no small matter. And so thinking about how to accelerate the work in the profession has been something we've been working on really focus, in a focused way for about eight years now. Uh, we first got our start with the New York Library Association as a platform. And now we have a fiscal agent in the, the Suffolk Cooperative Library System, but we're still just a group of volunteers trying to do good work for other good people in the profession. So the program has now uh, become international. But the reason it's been taking off, I think, with such speed at this point is because we all understand the power of libraries to improve the lives of people in our communities that we serve. Whether you're a public library, academic library, or school librarian, we all know the power of public libraries. And so leveraging libraries on behalf of our communities is something we do every day. So how do we do that with purpose in the context of climate change? That's what we've really been working on here through the project. And we got a huge boost in that work in 2019 when ALA named sustainability as a core value of our profession using the same definition we do, which is the triple line definition, which acknowledges both the environmental stewardship component, social equity, and economic feasibility, which Matt's going to unpack for us here today. But that ability to bring the profession together using common vocabulary and building this wider and wider community of practice is a big part of what we've been working on. So Matt and I are going to hopefully introduce you to some resources today, some thinking, and give you some places to start, because hopefully you're really energized after the event this morning to get started. And so this is a, a smart place to get started. Yeah, and just to emphasize that point, Rebecca, before I jump in this slide, is that, you know, we we obviously are very proud of the work that we've done here with the SLI, but we really don't, it doesn't matter how you get to this work. Um, I think that there's resources we have available. We'd love for you to join us, but at the end of the day, libraries need to be moving faster and faster and faster into this space in order to make sure that our, our institutions remain relevant and that we remain able to serve our community. And I think that was the point you were hoping I would make before about mission. And I'm a strong advocate that our mission is to improve our communities. And so that includes everything about the community we serve. So someone said, My, mine only says education or entertainment or information. Right. But really what it says is you're there to, to help your community be better. And that in, includes the water, the air, the earth that we use, the way we use those things we can be um, stewards of that. We can make sure that those get used well and that we can bring people together to make those decisions. And I think that the Sustainable Libraries Initiative helps to frame that thinking. And I think that Margaret did such a good job to, to make that point as someone who's been in the program. Rebecca, you've been in the program with your team. I've been in, in my team. And really getting to this understanding of the triple bottom line, I think was so key in that. And I know we struggled at the beginning of talking about our program to get to the point of using this framework to change people's minds about it. And what do I mean by that? Well, basically 
The triple bottom line is a new framework for how you're making decisions. And it could be from the simplest decision of what copy paper should I be buying all the way through how do we solve some of the challenges in my community and does the library put resources behind them? And so you're balancing those choices. Um, I think that's a word you use often during your presentation in your keynote, Rebecca, was that idea of balance. Does it help the environment? Is it socially equitable? Meaning the people that do the work, are they being taken care of for the ones that actually get impacted by the work? And finally, can we afford it? Or does it save us money over the long term? And as you're making these choices among other about a bunch of different things, that's the balance you're looking for. And I think that it's uh, we use that throughout the Sustainable Library Certification Program to train you on how to think about these decisions, that they all matter, that they all need to be in balance, but that sometimes that equation is gonna lean a little bit stronger to one than the other because of what you are able to do, because movement towards a better decision to us is better than no movement towards any decision. So where does this work start from? And in the Project Drawdown, which is this fantastic resource that tried to really use um, calculating through a scientist to, to determine where differences can be made in the fastest way towards us moving climate change and, and, and addressing climate change, determine that basically every job is a climate job. None of us can ignore this, whether what to, to, doesn't matter what position you have. I'm a retiree, that's my job, and my job is a climate job. Whether I'm just uh, working at the front desk a few hours a week, like my mom does at the Brookhaven Free Library, her job is a climate job, my job in administration, climate job. So where it starts in your institution, who brings that to the table, who decides that this is something we can focus on, it really should be everybody thinking about it, but we wanna make sure that you feel empowered no matter your level and where you work to lead the charge, to be the one that rings the alarm and says, yes, we need to be in this space. Yes, we need to be doing something. And really I'm gonna, be coming at you every day for every moment and every second, which will make administrations love you um, till we start doing something about this. And we hope that the SLCP will help you with that. So why, why, why all this? Why do all this work? Well, the smart people at the Center for the Futures of Libraries, which is a think tank for the American Library Association came up with the big ideas that are gonna help libraries approach things obviously for the future. And one of those is the idea of collective impact. And here, to me, is where we really got our ground, is you can have the best ideas and, and, um, and everyone can have their best ideas about what to do. But we decided to try to channel them down, especially on this very large topic of climate change, to some very specific actions that if we all took them together, would make an appreciative difference in how libraries are using resources, helping their communities, that it would be measurable, that would be focusing those efforts to actually make a difference. And so we could point to and say, libraries made a difference in fill in the blank, whether it's literacy, whether it's reducing um, CO2 admissions, whether it's helping our communities be more resilient, which it's, um, navigating our way through um, a disaster in our area. We can use the SLCP to guide you through so that it help you make those decisions so your impact goes up and we all do a better job. So institutions that express themselves, uh, we, we kind of came up some, with some ways that we can describe it over time. It didn't just pop out at us. This wasn't something like, we were there on day one and we wrote on the board, here's what a sustainable library is. Um, this came over our practice and over our time. We think that you're living, living your values out loud, right? That this is something that you are so proud of that you're showing it everywhere. I mean, I can't imagine any grant writer who's getting the Charlotte Libraries applications and saying, this looks like they're really trying to you know, greenwash this thing. I doubt they really believe this. Everything in there is connected to the other one. Uh, Rachel, same thing. Oh my gosh, everything about that library is they have a plan. It's part of a process. They're trying to do things. Their values are all over the place and what they're trying to do. 
they are trying to be a sustainable library. They are working to be that catalyst for change, uh, to bring people together, to have participation in their communities. They are working on climate mitigation, which is, as Rebecca said, at the top to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, this whole thing about climate adaptation is we heard those examples that do that, truly being a sustainable library. So what does that mean? Well, some of the tools that we came up with uh, with the Sustainable Libraries Initiative to help libraries do all that stuff and become sustainable libraries was the first thing we can put was on the left is called the roadmap. And this is a basic guide, which is available as a PDF and as an app on Android and iOS uh, to help align your thinking. Um, I heard some mentions about we need to educate trustees, we need to get people on board, we need to have understanding in our building. This document, we think, helps to do that. It has a series of prompts that lets you write down some thinking that you might have. It allows the, some language to be shared and it has some best practices in there to allow you to start to think about um, what you need to be doing. And finally, the, the Sustainable Library Certification Program is really that next step that you can take that really will launch your library towards success. And we're gonna go through those in a little more detail now. So basically it's a step-by-step -step format. You're gonna be assigned a mentor who's actually gonna check in with you to make sure that your progress is moving along or help to find answers to questions that you might be having. It's got resources built right into it. It's baked right into the word. Oh my gosh, someone just signed up today, Rebecca. Check out the chat. Someone just signed up for the program right now. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm at a telethon. Um, and then the uh, there's a community of practice. So we gather people together uh, to bring them in to make sure that you get support from each other. As um, again, as she mentioned, that those Vermont libraries gather every month and they're answering those questions for each other. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do we move through this? How do you weigh garbage is always the big one. So what does that look like? Well, there's all these different categories uh, that we're gonna we're gonna make you focus on. Uh, I think there's over 140 questions that we ask you. You do not have to answer them all to finish, um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But we want to make sure that we are doing a thorough job that you're examining your organization from the top, from the bottom, from the left to the right. And the thing about this is it's not about one personality. Um, this is not about, you know, Matthew really cares about this program at HOPOG. It's that the institution cares about it. And so one of the major first points is, is having your organizing body, whether it's a board of trustees or a city government or something, say, we are committed to do this work. Because then that way it'll continue regardless of who's in the various chairs to get the work done. We think that's vital, that it carries on throughout the life of the organization and that from this point forward, we wanna be counted as someone who's caring about the environment this much. And then it goes through all those basic things about the building, about uh, land use, water use, recycling, purchasing, partnerships, all throughout the various thing. And that's for public and academic. And then we turn it over, and we have a program for just school librarians. Their focus is obviously different. They have a lot less agency over the, the, the workings of their building and their infrastructure. But what an impact they have, of course, on the young people of, that they are uh, interacting with and allows them to rise up and to become that leader and be recognized by school boards, recognized by building administration, and be an example of that good thinking that they can help their community with. So here's a, an idea of some of the actions. Obviously, um, they're doing great. All these things have been accepted, all these required actions that they have. So good job, fantasy library that's uh, being shown on this screen. But it just gives you an idea of the detail that we get into. Um, how are your litter-free outdoor spaces, right? Very important. You want to make sure that you, you're taking care of the trash that you have. Are you dealing with inv invasive species, using native plants, eliminating or reducing your chemical pesticides and herbicides? The idea here is that you are, are going to go through a series of prompts, and Rebecca's on the next slide going to show us what those look like to really get you through those answers. Now, what are those answers? There is no correct answer. Um, for instance, in my situation, I rent the space at the Hop Hog Public Library. We don't own our building. 
So for me to be able to answer things about energy usage and the rest, I pay a flat fee for energy for the next 30 years. Lucky me. Um, but I don't really have control over those bills. I can't show that this, that, or the other can happen. But what I was able to do was advocate with my landlord to say, hey, can we use LED lighting? Is there a way to control when the heating system gets turned on and off? Can we you know, shut some of these things down? So in my response to those questions, I said, I advocated with my landlord to do as such, right? I can't say that I did it, but I can show that I, I was aware of it and I was able to speak towards it. So each of these uh, various and sundry uh, questions that we're gonna ask you are basically formatted like this, where it gives you resources to help you find those answers. Now, you get to hear and you read all those resources and you're like, what? I don't understand. That's what the mentor comes in. And then the mentor can come in and help you get through it. Why should I do this? <laughs> You're talking about all this work. Why do I want to do this? Well, I think for many, I think I saw folks put it into the uh, chat before. It could be used as part of strategic planning. It could be used to help to gel a team. Um, you could use it to restart some thinking at your library. You can use it to infuse energy um, into your library that maybe is lacking or there's a story that you'd like to be telling or maybe the best one, is it's actually the thing you need to be doing. It's the right thing to be doing in this day and age because it'll guide you along and show the authenticity of your institution, that the, the choices that you're making, that the dollars that you're spending from your community that you're in charge of, that you're spending them back the right way because a third party is gonna say that you've been doing the right things, that you're making the right investments in the right way and you're making these choices well for your community. Plus, it does all these other things. And I think the best picture on here, or actually both pictures represented, is that on the left and the right, our local politicians are showing up and recognizing that our libraries are doing the right thing in the communities. And the one on the right is especially good because that is the county showing up at the, at the Lindenhurst Public Library to talk about EV charging stations being set up at public libraries, which is a project that's a little iffy right now, but let's just say at the time it was gonna be the good thing, um, and saying that the Lindenhurst Public Library has demonstrated a commitment to sustainability for their community, and we wanna show our demonstration of that here too. And Rebecca and I high-fived each other at that point because that's what we talked about years ago when we started this. This was exactly what I'd hoped for, was that an outside elected official was calling out the library for the good stuff they're doing. That can't hurt our image in our communities, and it can't hurt when it comes to budget time, when it comes to requests that we're making, and the future of our institution. So while this is a certification program and, you, and we hand out you a certificate at the end or an award at the end, you're really never done. Because what we're saying here is that you will finish and we will award that and have a celebration with you. But those decisions don't stop. Uh, you're going to have to make those throughout the life of the institution. And so we really view it as a beginning of a journey. And we think that the certification program will allow that mindset change for you to adopt and to understand and to practice in a safe, guided, mentored way then to move out in the future and to be a leader in your community and then to have local institutions come to you and say, how did you do that? We were just at one for the Huntington, uh, excuse me, Harborfields Public Library and the two guys from the town hall were like, why are we doing this at the town hall? Our place is a dump. We need to fix it. We need to do X. We need to do Y. And we were like, yep, that's right. Uh, come to the library and we'll help you figure out how to get your house in order. We brought a couple of examples just to, to give you a little bit of inspiration. The Curtis Memorial Library is the first library in Maine uh, to be certified. A uh, shout out to Curtis Memorial. Matt and I took our vacation with our spouses there so we could check out all the amazing things they did. And just a, a few, I mean, think about that over 100 actions they took. But what's reflected in what you're seeing here is the respect of biophilic design, bringing nature indoors so that people feel healthier and have more exposure to fresh air. You're seeing community garden programs, one of the most impressive library of things collections 
Thrones I have ever seen um, that speaks to a lot of the traditional things we do in terms of technology, but also kitchen appliances and citizen science kits, and really thoughtfully interfiled with our print collections, really changing the nature of what it looks like in the stacks of that library. Just so many thoughtful details. And probably the highlight of the tour was their new electric vehicle bookmobile, uh, which was just so thoughtfully designed and um, implemented in their community. Just a, a powerhouse of a library, really exemplifying the attributes of the sustainable library that, that Matt outlined for you earlier here today. You can see their final presentation and all the final presentations of sustainable libraries on the Sustainable Libraries website. If you want to poke around, see what they did, get inspired by their uh, what they accomplished, you could do that in the next five minutes. Mamakating Library is the most recently certified library, one of our real small libraries that have just done really big things thanks to the program and really focusing on bringing community together. You see them um, uh, you know, just encouraging folks that wouldn't normally talk to each other, find excuses to do so and, and be neighbors. And there's certainly, uh, I just loved their presentation. I'm sorry, we only have a few more minutes left here to talk today because you can learn so much from each of these libraries who have gone through the program. So if you're looking for examples like, what does this look like? What are you actually doing? What would this look like in my library? Here are the folks that went first and they're sharing their story with you right on the website. Um, this is my own program here at Mid Hudson. Uh, we're a library system, not an individual library, but because of our work and our leadership on the topic, some grant money came our way, just like Matt was talking about in Lindenhurst and the county investment um, throughout the county on EV charging infrastructure located at libraries. A nonprofit approached us and said, hey, do you think libraries are the right place for community resilience work to happen? And I said, why, yes, yes, I do think so. Uh, and they helped us pilot this new program called the Library of Local, where um, 16 of our member libraries have become hubs where they specialize in collections on community solutions, food security. They all have seed libraries. Uh, garden tool lending, and they're mapped with the New York State Climate Smart Communities, which is a state program that helps to accelerate climate action through municipalities. So the idea is that libraries are accelerators for this work. How do we make that more visible, more palatable to other people in the community? The program has been a lot of fun, and we've learned a lot through it. But as Matt said, it's not just a destination we're trying to get you to. It's a real journey that is changing the organizational culture so that you make better decisions moving forward, regardless of what champion is sitting in which seat. Um, so this is a great example of one of the libraries that finished early on, the Longwood Public Library, and they identified goals for themselves. They're going to keep working. They created new benchmarks for things they're going to work on. And it just keeps that work going, keeps the momentum going and reminds that library, their staff, their board, their community, who we want to be. What is our legacy at the end of the day? So Rebecca, I want to do this. I already did it, but I want to do it now. I'm at a new library. What do I do? How do I get started? You got to talk to your folks, right? You got to convince, you got to make the case. Um, Rebecca tells a great story of this in her own institution. And we've heard it time and time again that she literally wrote the book. She literally wrote this thing. And her boss was like, eh, I don't think so. So, I mean, you had to come back and make that case for it and frame it in a way that makes sense to them. But until you do that, until you convince folks that this is the way to go, this is what I need to do. And whatever level you're at, remember, every job's a climate job. Wherever you are in your organization, you're going to have to work up and find the folks that get to make these choices for you. Um, it is work. Um, and the fact is, what we found is that many people, I think it was mentioned before, are already doing these things. So you might have looked at that list and said, well, we've gone through that or we've addressed that. And we've had libraries who have been lead gold, lead silver, who said, we've done a lot of this work, great. But what about some of the other things that are on the list? You know, Can you complete the picture? Can you finalize? Can you fill in all the blanks? Well, you might have covered that, that's great. There might be other work you do, but it might not be new work. We might already be partnering with an organization. We might already do stuff related to uh, climate, um, what am I thinking, National uh, Disaster Preparedness Week or some other ideas you might already be doing that work, which is great. We want to recognize that because I think libraries tend to not do a great job of tooting their own horn about what they're up against. And we view this as an opportunity for you to say, here we are making those great um, investments. We're doing those right things. And then you want to bring an internal team on board. Who's actually going to do the work? Is it you and somebody else? Is it a team of 100? Are you multiple branches? Again, this scales. And I think we can show you how that works. 
when you get in touch with us and we can take you on a tour of, of what this looks like. Um, once you get into the program, you're gonna get an, a website orientation. You're gonna get introduced to your mentor. You send out a survey. Then you start moving into the next generation of the teams. And then you're gonna go through the work that you're gonna do. So we have a lot of folks who are in it right now, over a hundred libraries. And we are literally from Maine to California at this point. And we have uh, Canadians are uh, joining us as well, uh, who are knocking on the door. And I think Australia is not too far behind personally. Um, so the point is, is that it's growing. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, state associations uh, and we've been making uh, arrangements with them so that we can uh, come to state association conferences that we can uh, provide a discount to the Sustainable Lir Library Certification Program while the state association members get our, could be members of the SLI for free. And you're gonna get access to, to some resources there and some past webinars and vendor lists and um, some of those uh, presentations as well, um, while you might be considering joining. So we think that's a good model for us as well. So any State Library Association people out there want to talk to us, please uh, look us up. Um, and uh, But I think the big thing that we do, uh, if you're curious, is we do a, a monthly uh, meetup where we take one of the categories uh, within the program and kind of expand upon it or look for input about it or ways people have done it or a conversation about it. And that could be a way to start to meet people and understand what we're talking about as well. At, at the end of the day, though, it really comes down to this quote from Alvin, Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock back in the 70s, that as you know, library leaders in whatever position you're in, you are a library leader, uh, as well as having climate uh, be a climate job. But you've got to remember those big things while you do all the small things. And I think that's a, a lot of what this presentation this morning has been about, that you're going to make decisions about your facility one way or the other. You're going to confront capacity issues with your facility one way or the other. So as you start to make the decisions to address the barriers and the challenges that you have in your facilities, why not keep the big things in mind, which is what your community is dealing with when it comes to climate change and how you're building as part of a community's adaptation strategy. So as you think about all the little choices you make every day, you've got to keep that in the back of your mind. And because you came to this workshop today, now you can't unknow the things that you've heard here. So all of those adaptation strategies that we talked about, we know some hit the mark and some may not have hit the mark for your particular situation, but the way you think about it is the same for everyone moving forward, that we all have to acknowledge the reality of what's happening and take that stewardship responsibility for our organizations as well as the facilities to make sure they're responsive and relevant to the community in the future. So just a last uh, thing here to wrap us up and get to our Q&A and the new resources the state libraries have put together for you. Um, if you went to sustainablelibrariesinitiative.org, that's the website we referenced earlier in the day. That's where you can see the final presentations, check out those federal uh, funding opportunities in the newsletter, download the mobile app for the roadmap. Um, there's at least three library associations in the Northeast that are already partners with the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. So if you're a member of the Massachusetts Library Association, the New Jersey Library Association, or the New York Library Association, you already have free membership um, and you can access the other resources that are there to help you benchmark your CO2 emissions and start measuring reducing your greenhouse gas emissions over time and all sorts of goodies that are there. And if you want to get into the certification program, you've got a little on-ramp there for that as well. Um, but we thank you for your patience and listening to this because we think the focus and urgency that has been missing in the profession on the topic, we're now starting to see emerge. And so you can find another way to do it, or you can join this program, but one way or the other, we hope you prioritize this work in your strategic thinking for your library moving forward. And we really thank the state libraries that came together to put this event on to again, help accelerate this work because that is what's called for in this moment. So Michelle, thank you very much. I think there's a Q and A opportunity here or moving on to your other content you'd like to show. So, um, uh, Deborah, do you want to take a question or would you like me to do that? Hi, sure. Um, okay, we have a, a question that says, does the um, SLCP program have anything to do with your actual building? Um, ours is from 1903 and super inefficient. 
<laughs> it does. You might have noticed there were categories related to energy conservation, water conservation, land use. So it, there are categories that are more specific to your facilities. And as Matt noted, we really scaled it. So we cross-referenced a lot of different thinking that's out in the field of uh, building management and construction. So it should work for you if you've got an older even a historic building or a newer building, or you're about to build a new building, it helps you think about the categories that you need to think through. Um, so some of those questions will, will uh, be applicable to you and some may not, but it does help create the categories of thought to walk through regardless of your, your facility situation. Yeah, I think, you know, Rebecca, that kind of went to your um, keynote that you gave where you know, when you're thinking through the facility that you're trying to present to your community, um, you know, that facility plan, right, that idea that you're lining up that thinking to make sure that your facility can operate in a certain way is, you know, are you literally spending more to heat and cool it than it would take to renovate it? Or, you know, what are the choices that you're making and where do they fall in? So, I, how often do we hear, um, well, I'm in the old building or that's the library and it's always been and it never, you know, it can't never not be. Well, is that really the best facility then to provide the services you need for your community? It may be, but then is the investment going in to make sure that it um, it's not as inefficient as you're, you know, that you're saying or telling us that it is from 1903? You know, what what would it take to change that? What story has to be told? And this is a methodology that could maybe help with that to say, Hey, listen, I here's the case. I went through what's happening in our county. Here's the stuff that you know we expect to see. This building is equipped to do five of the 27 things it needs to, you know. And then is that the right thing for it? Is it is this place we want to stay? Or do we do we think we need to change? Thank you, Matt and Rebecca. I'm not saying, oh, do I have oh, one more? Question? Yes, we do have one more question. Um can you become certified if you do not own your building? We are about to move into a new building that is owned by the village. Yes. Yeah, Matthew's in that situation. Uh, he leases his space, so it doesn't really control every aspect of the building, much to his frustration. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely still become certified. Like we said, there's going to be some questions. They just don't apply to your situation. And so you just say not applicable and, and move on. Well, thanks, Rebecca and Matthew. Uh, that was really wonderful. I'm going to, um, well, we could probably finish a little bit earlier, but I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Dutcher again right now, who's going to talk about resources, and then I'll finish it up with next steps. So, Deborah, go ahead and show us the LibGuide. Sure. So, I just popped the um, link to the LibGuide in the chat, and I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So, this is, it's a living document, very much a work in progress. And I want to thank um, Lauren Starr from the, uh, formerly of the Massachusetts Board of Library Commission for um, putting together this lib guide. And um, so we, it starts with um, some general resources. And then we have a page for every single state here um, that was a part of this summit. Um, so, um, as you see, there, there's a whole lot of room for some more resources from, from everybody. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I need to find the chat. I'm going to put in the chat my email so that you can send Uh, any resources that you would like to have put under your state on the LibGuide? Do we have any questions about the LibGuide? So I really do need all of your help <laughs> to populate this and, and have this uh, be a, a great re resource for us all. There were a lot of good uh, there were a lot of good suggestions and resources that were popped into the chat. So please, you have Deborah's um, email now. Please send those resources to her, and she'll be. Uh, we're very lucky someone stepped up to volunteer uh, to take this over. So thank you, Deborah, for doing that for us. But please do send her some of the things that you listed in the chat. 
All right, so going forward from that, thanks again, Deborah. I appreciate it. And just following up on uh, next steps, um, first of all, I wanna say thank you to our wonderful speakers today, for to Rebecca and Matthew, who always, um, who always are so wonderful and they do such important, incredible work. And I'm so happy that it's not only becoming known nationally now, but internationally. I know you've been working on it for a long time. And um, it's just always, always a pleasure to highlight uh, the hard work that you're doing and to finally see a lot of it starting to pay off. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of that. And so thanks for joining us today. I want to thank Rachel and Margaret for coming on and sharing their experiences with their libraries. Again, I think it is very important that you all know that libraries of any size can do something. And I think what's particularly helpful with Margaret and with uh, Rachel is sometimes when you talk about something like the, the kitchen card or things like that, and that I always think, oh, it sounds like so complicated. You know what I mean? And then you see a picture of it and you realize, you know, I think that we could actually do that. It may not be as complicated or as difficult as it sounds. Um, same with the community gardens and the things that you do outside of the library. So I think it's really uh, very helpful to actually see um, photographs of what the smaller libraries are doing so that you know you can implement that on a smaller scale. Notice a couple other things like in the chat today that I wrote down. Um, and one is that, you know, uh, I'm going to take this uh, to heart, and that is we need to have some urban libraries uh, come in on these discussions because, um, you know, a lot of times uh, their needs are very, very different from what you're going to find out in these suburban small libraries. So we'll take that to heart next time and see what we can do to bring some urban libraries in and maybe some very, very rural libraries at the same time. Um, other things I noted was that we had some people, even though we have this open to seven Northeast libraries, um, I'm going to I'm going to talk with um, with Kelly afterwards, and I'm going to see if I could get a list of, well, first of all, break out the list from the people that attended, um, see where they were from. But I think uh, Kelly also noted that we had at least nine people here from other states. So that indicates that this is a topic that maybe we can expand upon. And at least I'm thinking, you know, uh, include more of the, uh, the Northeast um, Coastal libraries, like I mentioned in the beginning, Delaware and Maryland had already approached me for interest. But in, um, in just finishing up and saying thank you to everyone who came today, we had a really wonderful attendance. But I do want to thank the state libraries, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island, New Jersey. Um, some of the players kind of changed in and out throughout the year as we were planning this. But every single one of those states I uh, was very dedicated to putting on the summit. Um, we met probably monthly or, you know, as, as we got closer to the summit a little more often, Rebecca and Matthew joined us. And so I just want to give a special thank you to all those state libraries who hung in there, who were very committed um, to, to putting on this summit. Uh, and I think it turned out very well. Looking forward to doing another one in the future. We've already been talking about that. We have a tentative date of March 21st of 2024 uh, for the next summit. Um, we're already throwing around some ideas. One of them is about talking about how to become a, um, the library as a resilience hub and then um, landscaping, some landscaping ideas for resiliency. So those are just some of the thoughts that we've come up with for right now. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if there's any ideas you wanna pop in the chat, um, or you can uh, reach me directly and um, I'm going to pop my email in the chat. So if there's anything that you would like to connect with me about, um, I'm looking at any kind of ideas that you would like to see in the future. I will look forward to hearing them and I will be happy to pass them along um, to all the libraries that help put the summit on today. Um, and I think I will be contacting all those libraries so we can kind of do just like it afterwards. Uh, a debriefing and see how we all what we all thought and how how we all made out. Uh, in the meantime, I don't see any other um, I don't see any other questions, and I want to thank you all for your attending today, uh, all throughout the morning, and for hanging in there with us. And thanks again to our speakers, especially. So take care, everyone, and uh, we will be emailing out the 
uh, slides. We'll be emailing out the um, a link to the um, to the presentation to the whole summit this morning. So you look forward to getting those in the mail. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again. Bye bye.